Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in dentistry and more. Today's session is about uh, public health dentistry, that is a question paper discussion. Previously, I uploaded one uh, video regarding the same, uh, but it was not uh, in detail one. But uh, this will be a part by part series. Uh, we have made it into uh, six parts uh, and that will be covering uh, all the chapters and the questions uh, which has been asked in university question paper over the last seven to eight years and we are following the questions of Kerala University of Health Science. So today's session that is a part one will be including the first three chapters that is uh, Sorbonne Peter chapters one two and three that is introduction to dentistry then public health and dental public health and the important chapters water purification and waste management so these five chapters will be discussed in today's session so we'll start with the first chapter that is introduction to dentistry this is not very important chapter but mostly uh, two short notes will be asked from this chapter that is general council of india and indian dental association a dentist act is very rarely asked but uh, dentist act is associated with dental council of india so you must be knowing few things about dentist act so dentist act of india which was uh, uh, which made as a law by the parliament on 29th march 1948 like any other law dentist act of india also has many chapters so dentist act has five chapters they are chapter one introduction which says about uh, who is a dentist who is a dental hygienist who is a mechanic dental mechanic chapter two is the most important one that is general council of india it alone can ask as a short note chapter three the state dental council chapter four uh, state dental council means uh, the constitution the roles and duties of state dental council similarly with the dci Chapter 4 uh, explains about the registration process, transfer of registration, all those things. And last chapter, miscellaneous, it is about the punishment, the obligations, and a little bit about the ethics of dentists towards uh, colleagues and society. The most commonly asked question of this chapter is Dental Council of India. Sometimes it will be functions of Dental Council of India, sometimes just Dental Council of India. So you need to write about uh, its responsibilities as a recognition to dental degree, then uh, maintaining a standard of dental education in our country. And they send inspectors to assess the standard of examination for a new college. Let it be a new course, BDS or MTS, they send examiners until the first batch is passing out. Then uh, they decide the experience required for the registration of teaching faculty and they started on 12th april 1948 that is dentist act came in 12th and uh, 29th march 1948 so next year dca came into existence that is 12th april 1949 so the election process of dc so any dca uh, will be i mean uh, usually it is a uh, five five years ten years so at a time there will be members from all these categories so this is how uh, the members of dc been selected that is there will be one member from every uh, state that is state registry of part a uh, then one member from medical council of india four members will be selected from the group of deans principals and vice principals of our country i mean the rental colleges of our country then one member from each university and six members nominated by the central government and one by the state government. So all these members constitute the Dental Council of India. So functions we already seen. So we need to write about this part and the function part as a short note answer for the question of Dental Council of India. Next question is Indian Dental Association. So Indian Dental Association is not a statutory body. It is for the um, upliftment of uh, civilization this is what they meant and it is basically for the dentist and their uh, activities 
So first dental association was started by Dr. R. Ahmed, who is known as the father of Indian dentistry. Sorry, one A is missing here. Sorry for that. So he started the Bengal Dental Association as All India Dental Association. First name of IDA or Indian Dental Association was All Indian Dental Association. So he started in 1928 in Bengal. Uh, same person started the first dental college in India, that is Bengal Dental College. So this All Indian Dental Association changed its name to IDA in 1949. So after that, it is known as IDA. So it is having a jumbo committee. That is one president, one president elect. That is the next one who is going to replace this person and one past president, three vice president and honorary general secretary and assistant, one treasurer, one secretary of CDH and one editor. So totally in our country, we have 29 state branch, seven union territory branch and 450 local branch and one defense branch. This number might be changed because many local branches are popping up. So how can we take membership? See, all these things you need to write in Indian General Association, a little bit about its history, its head office, its branches and its membership and function. So honorary members are very respected people's uh, in the field of dentistry, they will be kept as honorary members, life members, they will not pay the annual fee, they will pay only one one time fee and they will become life members, they will be very easy in most members. Annual members, they pay annual fee, then the direct members, they work at the same place where they are joining in their association. Student members can join IDEA, affiliate members, they work at different place than their home city. So they will be affiliated to that home branch or vice versa. And functions. Functions are uh, like keeping annual conferences at various levels, conducting programs uh, like uh, seminars, lectures, panel discussion. It's not panel discussion, it's panel discussion. And other school dental health checkup or treatment camps, and also publishing monthly journals. I'm not going uh, line by line, you need to just highlight the main points. Okay, uh, next chapter we have introduction to public health. The commonly asked question is what is primary health care and what are the principles of primary health care? Primary healthcare, we know, uh, we don't need to write a very detailed definition. If you know a de definition, that is well and good. Primary healthcare is nothing but providing health at very basic level. That is providing health at primary health center or sub-center where the first contact of people comes with the healthcare system. So we have four principles of primary healthcare. Uh, in public health industry, we get many principles. So don't get confused. We have principles of epidemiology, principles of health education. So there are many principles. So always uh, keep uh, some connection with each principle to that topic so then you don't write the other answer for uh, this question. So we have four principles. The first one is equitable distribution. That is, we need to provide for the needy people. That means if we have lots of hospitals at uh, urban area and very uh, less number of hospital at rural area, that is not equity. Sometimes on a larger scale, we can say that total number of hospitals is proportional to the people. That might be an equal distribution, but it is not equitable distribution. Equitable means we should provide for the or as per the need. Okay, so there should be ample amount of health services corresponding to the number of people present. So uh, usually in India, what we say is equal distribution or somewhat equal distribution total uh, population doctor population ratio is fine but we know it is not equitable because in urban area we have one is to five thousand dentist population ratio that is well under the who norms but what happens is in rural area it is going up to one is to 2.5 lakh so that is not equitable so we need to have equitable distribution and for primary health care there is always community participation that is involvement of the community where the health is being provided like asha scheme or other volunteers they should be actively involved for the primary health care and there should be intersectoral 
coordination it is intersectoral coordination uh, sorry about this spelling mistake um, intersectoral coordination there should be a coordinated activity that is health administration section or finance section all should be coordinated and there should be appropriate technology the technology should be appropriate for the need of the people we should not uh, give hi-fi technology for the people who are not able to use it so it should be based on the need or the felt need of the felt need of the people that is the four principles so you can little bit explain about this if it has been asked for a short essay but mostly it will be short note if it is asked as a long essay you need to give a definition also for primary health care so the next question that is a short note epidemiological triad so epidemiological triad uh, there is nothing but the disease occurrence nowadays the disease interaction i mean disease occurrence is determined by the interaction of three factors that is agent host and environment not just by a one single factor so that is epidemiological triad you can explain it with some example of uh, uh, any disease you can start with uh, dental caries Next question is define public health. Describe in detail about the changing concepts of public health. So public health, uh, you need to give a definition, then changing concepts of public health. So there is another changing concept that is regarding the health, but we are talking about public health. So we have four uh, changing concepts. First one is disease control phase and health promotional phase, social engineering and health for all phase. And it starts from 8080. To 1920 there is 40 year period here also 40 year period then comes the 2020 last one is health for all which starts from 1981 to 2000 so in disease control phase it was mainly uh, focusing on the physical environment like water supply sewage disposal not particularly to control any disease uh, whereas health promotional phase is little more advanced uh, where the health promotional activities uh, like uh, women and child program, nutritional programs, uh, other programs were included. Uh, it was mainly implemented through primary health centers and sub centers and community development program also was there in health promotional phase. Whereas social engineering phase is in 1960 to 80. So it was mainly the concept of lifestyle diseases and risk factors. Uh, because a single risk factor can cause many diseases because after the uh, world has recovered from the world war uh, the lifestyle diseases started emerging to the affluent society that means uh, developed countries now in developing countries also this lifestyle diseases are on a uh, increasing fashion so risk factors are the main point of social engineering phase they were trying to control this risk factor and lastly, the health for all phase, which was the last one, where uh, the, the, the idea was to provide health for everyone, irrespective of the country or irrespective of the economic background of the country. So as we all know, 10 to 20% of the world population in developed countries has access to the health service of any kind. But the majority or the most of the people, 80% of the people is not having such an access. So that disparity should be removed. That was the aim of health for all phase. Now we have some short note. Uh, uh, what is primary health care or the levels of health care? So uh, levels of health care, we have three levels. That is primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary is the first contact through primary health centers and sub-centers. In secondary health care, we have uh, more problems will be dealt. That is... Uh, curative services surgery uh, mainly done through district hospital and community health centers and the last level or tertiary level is the super specialty hospitals and medical colleges where all the treatment will be done uh, next short note is the natural history of disease so it all comes under concept of causation so it has two phases pre-pathogenesis and pathogenesis phase Pre-pathogenesis uh, idea is the disease or the causative organism or the cause which is creating the disease has not entered the person. Okay, but there is a interaction is happening with the human and the environment so, or the agent host environment. 
interaction is about to initiate the disease process. That is a pre pathogenesis. Pathogenesis has not yet happened, but it is likely to happen. Whereas the pathogenesis phase, the entry of disease agent uh, happened in the susceptible host and the uh, organism multiplies and starts its physiological changes. And there will be incubation period then the early and late pathogenesis. So that was about the natural history of disease. Then we have germ theory of disease. So germ theory was the uh, first one uh, put forward by Robert Koch. Uh, the one-to-one -one relationship, a single organism is causing a disease. But it is um, in 20th century early period only, it was rejected for many reasons. Because now we know it is not just single uh, agent causing disease. We have many other theory, web of causation, epidemiological triad, multifactorial causation. And this cannot explain all the lifestyle diseases like uh, hypertension, diabetes, or cardiovascular or cancer. Uh, you can explain about course postulates, the four postulates are there. So that also you can include um, to get the good marks because everybody will be writing all this. So if you put extra points, you will be uh, getting good marks. Uh, iceberg phenomena also uh, once asked uh, for university. So iceberg phenomena is nothing but the clinical cases which will be visible uh, above the water level and the invisible cases or asymptomatic cases will be undiagnosed cases or they are the carriers which is below the water line. Okay. So if we take iceberg of dental caries, we know the earliest uh, lesions D1, uh, D2 or subclinical will be under the water line. And the clinically detectable cavities, which is limited to enamel, dentine, which is D2 and D3, and uh, pulpal lesions only will be visible. But we do more screening or more uh, screening cams, we can uh, find out this D1 and D2. So that is the importance of screening. So iceberg phenomena is uh, mainly, uh, mainly it is. Uh, associated with uh, lifestyle diseases because most of the people will be under the water line i mean uh, the diabetes people or cardiac uh, diseases or hypertensive people they come to this part only when they feel symptoms now we have the changing concepts of health public health we already seen changing concepts we have four concepts biomedical ecological psychosocial and holistic uh, this is about health, not about public health. Okay, biomedical says health is just absence of disease. This is in term with the germ theory of disease. It is not taking consideration of any other factors like environmental, social, cultural, all other factors being excluded. So it was not at all an acceptable concept of health. Sorry. The second one is ecological. So it says that the disease happens due to the imbalance between the human being and environment okay but as a psychosocial says uh, the health is always influenced by the other factors like social cultural psychological economic and political factors holistic is more of a combination of all these factors uh, next question uh, it is not very frequently asked but sometimes it is a web of causation and multifactorial causation so it is all explaining the lifestyle diseases or chronic diseases uh, like web of causation model the heart disease the sleep apnea can cause low socioeconomic status can be a risk factor lack of exercise poor diet can be a uh, risk factor for the low socioeconomic status and high blood pressure associated with old age whereas high blood sugar associated with old age can also lead to heart disease so Tobacco smoking can lead to heart disease, high alcohol can lead to heart disease, then depression and stress can induce high alcohol intake for the person. So all these are linked each other. So we just cannot say that one is causing the other one. So that is a causation, web of causation. Uh, the multifactorial causation also is similar, uh, like uh, a single disease is not caused by a single organism like how the germ theory was put forward this is like multifactorial there is time factor there is diet factor there is host factor there is uh, bacteria that is the organism so all these combinedly producing a disease so that is about multifactorial causation now uh, whereas the spectrum of disease 
it is just a graphic representation of variation in the manifestation of disease so disease will be starting as a subclinical infection and reaching to a fatal illness so it is a sequence of events occur in human host from the subclinical that is the first contact of this agent to the uh, ultimate outcome which can be a death of a person or can be a very fatal one so next uh, chapter is introduction to dental public health so one question which was asked which is uh, not very important but it was asked define dental public health outline the dental public health problems in india and the national health programs in relation to dental public health problems so it is not very uh, you can you cannot write very detailed question answer for this because there is not uh, much pro programs related to dental public health problems only tobacco control program is there and cancer is not particularly about oral cancer it is overall so you just cannot write a very uh, specific answer for this anyway you need to write uh, the definition then the dental public health problems what india is facing like the workforce unequal distribution uh, there is no concept of primary oral health care and the internship program is always underutilized and people always go to uh, over the counter medicines for dental pain and other conditions they have a lack of awareness and oral health at rural area they have no access they have no uh, dental hospitals dental clinics in those area the dentists are reluctant to work in rural area and research and programs on dental public health is at its very nascent state in india because we are never a research oriented country we are always on a curative basis so you can explain more about uh, these problems in your own words if the question asked as general public health problems in india so some of the national health programs we you know preventive and promotive health care like intravenous program like uh, tuberculosis control program aids control program pulse polio and for non communicable diseases like control of cancer uh, prevention and control of deafness mental health problems so many programs are there we can list out few of these and the miscellaneous like immunization program janani shishu suraksha karyakram so many are there you can just list out it one or two in each category so the short note asked uh, was difference between public health dentistry and clinical dentistry so uh, you can uh, list out these uh, seven or eight points clinical deals with one patient here the group of population care okay, patient comes to practitioner where practitioner goes to the patient patient can pay for the service uh, depends on a big source like funding is a big thing in public health industry then uh, service provided will be immediate if you do a restoration you can uh, see, see the changes uh, very fast but this is focus on prevention so the changes uh, takes time Uh, individual practitioner is only concerned about patients suffering from disease but we public health practitioners takes account not just person but also are not suffering from it there is apparently healthy people are also being taken into consideration so more concern about period of pathogenesis but public health dentistry focus on pre pathogenesis that is the disease not yet occurred and the individual practitioner concern about environment is very limited but the public health professional studies in detail the environmental aspect of the disease so this is another question characteristics of public health methods so these eight are the characteristics of public health methods which is given in the solvent peter like group responsibility uh, it relies on group efforts prevention uh, concept of medical indigens Uh, and the multifactorial concept the biostatistical method dependence for public health and they deals with healthy and apparently healthy that was we were talking about pre pathogenesis and adaptation of programs to community culture so these are the characteristics of public health methods so what are the duties of public health entity so this was another question so health education and motivation uh, the treatment to community oral hygiene measures and caries preventive measures uh, community activities conducting camps and field programs and these are the tools of general public health 
that is epidemiology, biostatistics, social science, principles of administration and preventive dentistry. Now we have the important chapter that is water purification. The commonly asked question is like this. Define potable water, describe the methods of purification of water. So the main question which is asked in this chapter is define potable water, describe in detail various methods of purification of water. So potable water is nothing but it is free from pathogenic agents or chemical substances or any order and color. Uh, mostly we have large scale and small scale purification basic steps of water purification is storage, filtration and disinfection. So storage is basically for the slow sand filter where the storage will be there for one week or two week or we can use a natural or artificial reservoir. Filtration we have two methods slow sand and rapid sand. Currently used one is rapid sand filter because slow sand requires a big area, big land area it is not possible nowadays and it takes uh, one week or two weeks for the biological uh, layer to get formed over the sand bed. Uh, that is uh, the ripening of uh, the biological layer that the algae formation over top of the sand bed that is the schmutz stecke or uh, the whiter layer. Whereas a rapid sand filter mainly focuses on removing all those impurities by the alum or the coagulation process. They add chemicals and do the job very fastly. So that is uh, convenient for the present need. And the last step is this is a filtration. First we store it and in rapid sand uh, there will not be any storage. It is uh, directly uh, coming to the filter uh, and pumping out as a clean water. Whereas low sand filter only actually requires a storage space because it takes lots of time because we need to have a uh, formation I mean formed uh, biological layer of the sand bed. so it takes time one week or two weeks for this algae formation so it acts as a filter so disinfection is the last step of uh, water purification that is we add chlorine to it so it removes all the bacteria oxidizes ion and reduces taste and odors so the same question been repeatedly asked many times in 2014 also question will be a little different but the answer is same you need to be very alert so rapid sand filters actually started in usa have two types gravity that is peterson and pressure type so these are the steps of rapid sand first will be uh, coagulation the alum will be added so the impurities will be coagulated and sedimented so sedimentation tank at the bottom uh, we remove this uh, sedimented uh, coagulant, uh, coagulated uh, impurities will remove it and after that it will be sent to the filtration tank where there is filter bed will be present and the water will be filtered through it and will add the chlorine and send to the home I mean we send it out of the uh, water purification plant for the consumption so advantages of rapid sand filter is very rapid and we can deal with raw water directly without any storage so that is the most important and 40 to 50 times uh, faster because slow sand filter needs the formation of biological air it takes time and washing of the filter also is easy because in slow sand filter the filter cleaning is a tedious job because you need to remove the top layer of, of a filter bed the by default the filter bed will be very very large so we need uh, more men at work to remove all those filter bed always try to write this comparison because it is more of a compressed uh, com uh, points on these two methods so as i said slow sand filter requires large area compared to the rapid sand and the rate of filtration is very different it is faster here in rapid sand sand size is more in rapid sand the pretreatment is like coagulation because we add coagulant alum here there is no chemicals in slow sand filter cleaning is backwashing so that is we are going to see next slide scraping is as i said we just scrape it off and we keep the filter bed for to form a new biological layer so that's why uh, that's why it is uh, very uh, laborious time taking and uh, operation is like more skill because there will be uh, addition of coagulant, addition uh, of all these at different intervals or so we need more 
uh, people for the operation uh, removal of color is uh, better at slow sand bacteria is better almost 100 at slow sand so that was about uh, the rapid and slow sand filter comparison uh, next we have small scale water purification is done at home uh, like, like boiling chemical disinfection bleaching powder chlorine solution iodine uh, wells are cleaned uh, so all these include the small scale water purification mostly which is done at home chlorination is the last step of water purification it is mostly done using chlorine gas or perchlorone or or such uh, chlorine tablets or bleaching powder so sometimes question will be like principles of chlorination so water should be clear free from turbid chlorine demand is the amount required to destroy the bacteria oxidize organic matter and to neutralize the ammonia so always this is a thumb rule 0.5 milligram per liter for one hour is required for water okay so the sum of chlorine demand of specific water plus this 0.5 constitute the correct dose of chlorine to be added so we need to first find out the chlorine demand okay that is breakpoint chlorination then on top of that we need to add this 0.5 milligram per one liter okay so that is how we decide the dose of chlorine so vital air is another question we already discussed that is a uh, formation of this algae slimy layer over the slow sand filter which is known as heart of slow sand filter because it acts as a filter because we are not adding any chemical in the slow sand filter so we're just having this uh, a biological layer which is formed over the top of this sand filter so this filter will remove or it uh, uh, blocks the particles okay so after a few uh, weeks or uh, days we need to remove this by scraping off uh, and breakpoint chlorination is nothing but addition of chlorine to water to a point at which the free residual chlorine begin to appear so that amount we need to uh, calculate over that we need to add 0.5 milligram per liter that will be the dose of chlorine and backwashing backwashing what we do the cleaning process in rapid sand filter because uh, we are just reversing the flow of water okay so usually water comes from here and go through here so what we do is we reverse the water or we just pump air so what happens is the impurities which is present over the top of this water bed will be removed will be cleared out okay so it will be frequently done uh, in rapid sun filter so that is backwashing okay so the last chapter of this session is waste management mostly it will be short not or short essay will be asked from this chapter the commonly asked question is composting uh, let it be aerobic or anaerobic composting basically we have three methods that is Banklor method which is anaerobic where no oxygen is present which will be happening inside a trench mechanical composting which is aerobic uh, which is happening inside a, a, a machine okay it will be uh, with the presence of oxygen so that is mechanical and wormy composting uh, we know the one which we uh, create at home so composting is process uh, where we use only degradable um, things uh, to make a humus like material that is known as compost so mostly the byproducts are carbon dioxide water and heat but what we uh, what happens is when we mix uh, the bio non degradable uh, substance like plastic with this uh, the byproducts is not carbon dioxide instead there will be formation of methane which causes global warming uh, Banklor method or hot fermentation or anaerobic method which is invented by Indian Council of 
agriculture research at indian institute of science bangalore so it is like uh, trenches are dug uh, like this trenches will be dug and there will be layer by layer addition of uh, night soil night soil is soil uh, which includes human excreta and layer of cow dung or organic waste and layer of refuse uh, will be keep on adding it until the top layer is 9 inches thickness and then this is covered with excavated earth and compacted after 6 months uh, this will be opened and it will become a, a very good manure and we can use it for agricultural purpose. So the, there is uh, dimensions for uh, the trench we make. So uh, it, we should wait it for four to six months for this uh, waste to become a, a manure. So this is a Bangalore method, which is an aerobic, but mechanical composting is aerobic, where the materials will be degraded uh, into a big machines uh, and make it to a very a smaller components. And you can see this is. Uh, rotating uh, in the presence of oxygen so that is why it is aerobic composting uh, incineration is nothing but uh, reducing the uh, volume okay by burning the waste so there are three types single chamber double chamber and drop trichin so single chamber where the heat is around 700 to 1000 whereas a double chamber the material which was burned in the first chamber will again will be burned at a higher temperature 1200 to 2500 so again there will be reduction of volume rotary is very expensive uh, and it has got uh, it is the best method but it is very very expensive around 50 lakhs so uh, usually uh, very few uh, institute or few places uh, will be having this rotary kin. so mostly the double chamber is a convenient one then the methods of solid waste disposal we already seen what is composting what is incineration so the first method is dumping that is just open dumping but it will create lots of problem nuisance and the uh, rodents will take and the uh, 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 problems of uh, smell order and all these problems are there temping so little bit better thing is control tipping or sand free landfill uh, it is like uh, where natural pits are available or we can dig and deposit and if we have a sloping terrain uh, we take uh, a trench or we create a trench and we add the waste into it and cover it okay but we don't uh, segregate the waste so ultimately this is not a very good method but it is a better method than the dumping but what happens is the byproduct is methane gas it can create global warming because this methane uh, is not good for environment so this is categories of biomedical waste we have 10 categories and this is very commonly asked question uh, category number one two three four uh, anatomic waste, annual waste, microbiology, four is waste up and how it has been uh, disposed. Okay. Uh, sometimes this uh, color coding also will be asked. What is the color where it will be disposed? All the red color, yellow color and uh, the green one, black one. So all this will be asked as a short note. Okay. So that's all for this session. So I'll be uh, continuing the next session uh, with regard to the general epidemiology, which is the most, most important chapter uh, in public health industry. So this single chapter will be dealt as uh, part two. So I'll come with the part two session uh, next in my next video. So always make sure that uh, you write uh, point wise not uh, as a paragraph wise uh, always uh, draw underline uh, draw pictures make flow charts create uh, innovative answers rather than just bulking up your answer sheets because uh, you need to think about uh, the way it was being evaluated so uh, always make the answers uh, 
very presentable uh, by underlining with uh, red ink uh, and making boxes, making uh, flow charts or adding some pictures for like water purification you can add pictures so make it more innovative so these innovations will definitely get you more marks sometimes if you are in a borderline so these innovations will uh, just cross you uh, the borderline so uh, always uh, try to uh, write the answers in a more innovative way rather than just uh, bulking up paragraphs because uh, no answers will be read completely they will be just glancing it so if you find a point with underlined with reading uh, you will get the marks so that was about the session once so i'll come with the next sessions thank you Hello everyone, welcome back to the continuation of uh, public health dentistry question paper discussion. So last session was uh, part one where we discussed the beginning three chapters and uh, the water purification and waste management. And today's session part two will be dealing with the most most important chapter of public health dentistry that is general epidemiology. So epidemiology is not just a uh, important for your exam uh, it is also a very important uh, tool for you to do the research uh, when you are going abroad for uh, any public health courses like uh, MPH or other uh, masters uh, courses in uh, health sector or even you are doing an MBA or any other that kind of uh, courses or even if you are going for a post graduation uh, after videos uh, you would need a thesis research that is a research project in your postgraduate curriculum where you need all these principles of epidemiology uh, the concept of epidemiology so you would definitely need this chapter uh, for your future uh, career if you are to stay in your uh, dentistry uh, as a research person so general epidemiology while coming to our exam point of view uh, definitely one or two questions will be there in each exam mostly it will be an essay and many short notes and short essays been asked from this chapter the chapter is uh, the most complicated one but once you get the uh, core principles of epidemiology it is quite easy but uh, to be very honest on an undergraduate level it's not that easy to understand but uh, on an exam point of view uh, you can easily score marks in epidemiology uh, but uh, if you're much interested in epidemiology you can uh, go to internet or other textbooks to learn more about epidemiology so more knowledge in epidemiology would never go wasted definitely help you in future uh, as a research person so without much uh, further ado we'll start with uh, epidemiology so any essay question we'll start with these two things that is uh, defining and classifying epidemiology definition you need to write the john m last definition that is it's a study of distribution and determinants of health related states or events in a population and application of the same to prevent the disease uh, while coming to the classification we have broadly two classification one is observational and then experimental under observational we have descriptive and analytical 
and analytical is further divided into case control and cohort study an observational study the investigator has a role of observer whereas an experimental study the investigator not just observing he is actually intervening and it is classified as randomized control trial field trials and community trials and the uh, randomized control trial also has a non randomized uh, counterpart also so the first question uh, asked was uh, experimental epidemiology that is uh, asked many times sometimes the question will be of randomized control trial or mostly it is experimental epidemiology so experimental epidemiology uh, which is having two branches that is randomized control trial and non randomized control trial it depends on whether randomization is present or not so it is to provide a scientific proof and as a measuring method to test the efficacy of a drug or a method so what are the basic steps in rct or randomized control trial or experimental epidemiology so the first step is drawing up a protocol then we need to select the reference and sample population then we need to do the randomization that is participants will be allocated into experimental or control group after that we need to do intervention then follow up and outcome assessment so the protocol is a core of this randomized control trial or experimental epidemiology that it has everything about the study it explains about the aims and objectives the questions to be answered or the criteria for selection of the participants the sample size how we are going to allocate subjects into study and control group the treatment to be applied and the standardization of working procedures all those things will be mentioned before the start of study that is protocol after that we need to select reference and experimental population so before that uh, we need to take consent from the participant and the participant must be a representative of the population so that uh, the result obtained from the study can be extrapolated to the population so we need to be very careful while doing the sampling technique and patient should be eligible for the trials this is a core of uh, our city that is a randomization where we remove the selection bias where the participants are allocated into study and control group and by any of the method uh, it can be a lottery method or a computer generated method and it is known as a heart of rct and manipulation where the investigator intervene so in experimental study the investigator has a clear role rather than the descriptive study descriptive study the investigator just observe things but in experimental study he has a significant role that is he intervene the study group by deliberate application or so he apply some vaccine or drug as laid down in protocol so this manipulation creates an independent variable independent variable is a cause okay and whose effect is determined by the measurement of final outcome that is a dependent variable so the incidence of disease survival time so how the independent variable is affecting on the dependent variable that is the study is all about after that we need to wait for some time that is a follow up period how the two groups are acting uh, for the independent variable or the drugs or vaccine and we should take the Uh, or measure the outcome uh, sometimes there will be attrition problem that is loss to follow up because some patient uh, might go out of the study and patient might lose the interest and death can happen so that is a attrition problem in randomized control trial and finally we need to assess the result sometimes it will be a positive result or negative result so the types of rct uh, many types of rct the first one is clinical trial that is the most commonly used then preventive trials risk factor trials cessation experiments trial of etiological agents evaluation of health services so you need to just mention the names of all of it so this is the most commonly asked question experimental epidemiology so after that uh, we were studying experimental epidemiology it has to classification rct and non rct which is also known as quasi experiments quasi experiments uh, where we have a situation when a randomization is not possible uh, such as natural experiments uh, where we can do this 
uh, non-randomized trial, which is also known as quasi-experiment. Uh, we have natural experiment, uncontrolled trials, that is without any control group, and before after comparison studies. Next question is uh, again define epidemiology. Uh, you need to write the definition, then describe in detail about the analytical epidemiology. So analytical epidemiology is to formulate, uh, sorry, it is to test the hypothesis, whereas a descriptive epidemiology is to formulate the hypothesis. So in analytical epidemiology, we have two uh, broad classification that is case control and cohort study. So case control is as the picture shows, first we select people with disease and people without disease, they are known as cases and controls and we go backward and we ask the cases and controls about their exposure. If they have lung cancer, if they don't have lung cancer, we ask about their exposure that is the smoking. So how many of the cases were having smoking, how many of the controls were having smoking and we compare these two groups. So the step one is uh, selecting cases and control, then we need to match, then we need to measure the exposure. Exposure is nothing but the causal factor and analysis and interpretation. So we need to first select the case, we can select from hospital or general population and similarly control from the same hospitals or patients relatives or neighbors or even from general population the ideal ratio is one is to one okay we can go one is to four that is one case to four control but ideal is one is to one after that we need to do matching matching is process by which we select control in such a way that they are similar to cases but no this is so usually age and gender matching will be done if a patient with uh, lung cancer of 25 uh, year and a male patient, we need to select a patient uh, 25 year male but without lung cancer. Uh, it can be an individual or group match and we need to measure the exposure. So we are asking patients about their exposure status. So it is a retrospective study, we are going backward. So it can be done using interviews, hospital records and past records. Finally, we need to do the risk estimation. So in co case control study, the risk estimation is done by odds ratio that is odds of exposure. The chances of exposure among the cases versus among controls that is odds of exposure we are checking we are not actually calculating the relative risk we are checking the odds ratio because we are going backward it is a retrospective study we don't have clear data we are just asking questions to the people who already have disease or who are selected as a control asking about their previous history okay so it is an indirect method of risk estimation so whereas cohort study, uh, cohort study, uh, it is a prospective study, that is it is going forward. Okay, so there are three types of uh, prospective study, that is uh, prospective, I mean cohort study. Uh, one is uh, prospective cohort study, uh, retrospective cohort study, and uh, the combination of prospective and retrospective. So there is a slight difference in all these things. Prospective cohort study, this is actually speaking uh, cohort study, that is it starts from 2008 and it is going forward. When the study is done, there is nobody is having disease. So after some period of time, they will be categorized into exposed and non-exposed group. That is, we are selecting a group of college students without any smoking habit. So after a period of time, the college students, that is a cohort. Okay, cohort is a group which shares a common characteristics. That is a college students, that is a common characteristics. So they are automatically divided into smokers and non-smokers and we follow them for a several years and how many of them are developing disease in each group and we take the risk estimation. So that is the actual prospective cohort study. Whereas retrospective cohort study, it is a reverse uh, phenomena. It is not like a case control study. We are following back a cohort. Okay, so a historical cohort study it is. Uh, it is a prospective study in retrospective manner. So what is doing here is uh, we are taking a historical cohort uh, where the outcome. So in retrospective study, what is the difference from prospective study? The outcome has already occurred. So you might get confused. Case control study, the outcome has already occurred. But what the difference from case control study is we are following a cohort. Okay, a cohort is a group with a common characteristic, a college students or a group of people with a uh, smoking habit. So we are selecting a group of cohort. Cohort means a group with common characteristics. College students, 
uh, or a women in particular age group and we are tracing back their history in case control study there is no cohort we are just selecting cases and selecting the controls from um, friends or relatives or general population and asking questions but here we are tracing back a cohort okay so here the investigator goes back in time sometimes 10 to 30 years to select the study groups that is exposed and non-exposed from the existing records of the past employment medical or other records and traces them forward through time from a past date fixed on the record usually up to the present and to check if the disease has occurred or not so the advantage of this thing is uh, we can uh, still calculate the relative risk but without any delay in the study because in prospective study we have to wait the disease to happen the disease might not happen so all the time manpower money would go wasted and the combination of these two is known as combination of prospective and retrospective study okay so you don't need to worry much about an undergraduate level you can just write uh, the classification of cohort study whereas steps uh, similar to the case control selection of study subjects obtaining uh, data on exposure selection of comparison group follow-up and analysis so this is a flow chart similar to the case control study where you remember case control is going backward okay we are asking about exposure status okay exposure status but what is happening is we are taking a cohort a population over a period of time see time is going forward it is a prospective study forward looking study whereas this is a retrospective study okay we are coming from here to present condition okay so we are starting from past to present okay here we are starting from present to the future okay so exposed and not exposed so at the start of the study people are not having any disease okay in case control we are starting with disease and after a period of time we follow up these people and checking how many of the exposed are getting disease and how many of the non-exposed are getting disease so that is a framework okay similar to we need to select the study subject that is a cohort is very important it should be a cohort and the data from the cohort members medical reports or lab investigation and we need to select a comparison group it can be an internal comparison that is within the same cohort uh, as i said a college students from uh, their early time we can follow them some will be developing the habit of smoking they will be the uh, exposed group and the same cohort many will not be having the habit so they will become the comparison group or we can also select an external comparison and follow up we need to follow the patient for a period of time with uh, surveillance and medical examination and finally calculation of risk that is the actual risk that is relative risk can be calculated attributable risk and population attributable risk also can be calculated uh, next question is uh, define epidemiology and explain the steps of descriptive epidemiology so actually we have three major study design one is descriptive epidemiology actually we are going in reverse order descriptive epidemiology this is to formulate the hypothesis and the second one is analytical epidemiology this is to test the hypothesis we have case control and cohort and the first one we have experimental epidemiology okay this is to do experiments the experimental epidemiology where investigator has a clear role but in analytical epidemiology and descriptive epidemiology the person is not having a clear role rather he is a just observer he observes things and do the testing of or formulating hypothesis so descriptive epidemiology steps are first we need to define the population where we are going to uh, do the study then defining the disease under study we need to have a clear operational definition of the disease and we need to describe it this is the most important part describing the disease under place where it is spreading time how fast it is spreading and person how many of the people are getting in which age groups in which gender in which socioeconomic status all we need to describe and measure the disease with the help of tools of epidemiology that is in the name of uh, incidence or and, uh, the prevalence or attack rate or secondary attack rate we need to measure the disease and compare with non entices so we need to compare it with existing parameters finally we are formulating a hypothesis it is an assumption hypothesis is an assumption so the end of descriptive study is with the etiological hypothesis it could be the reason for that is smoking could be the reason for lung cancer we are explaining it with a could be so it is not a 
confirmative statement it is an assumption that is hypothesis and in analytical study what we do is we can go for a case control study or we can go for a cohort study and we need to test the hypothesis this could be will be changed to a relative risk or a odds ratio that is more confirmative okay uh, so i have not explained uh, the details uh, of all this uh, in uh, written so uh, each step has to be explained well if it is asked as a essay question now lots of short notes uh, and uh, before that uh, these three main question can be also asked as a short essay okay so in that time you don't need to explain much but when you are writing cohort study and case control study make sure you draw all these flow charts okay now the prevalence prevalence is nothing but all the cases old and new okay this is a proportion so it can be a point prevalence or a period prevalence point prevalence is old and new cases at a given point or as a period at a given period okay point prevalence we take the population but period prevalence we take mid interval population mid interval population means if a one year period of population we are taking we take the population of june 1st that is a mid portion or a mid part or the middle of 365 days that is a starting of 6 month uh, july 1st i mean not june july 1st because it's june 6 months and july to december 6 months so that is a mid interval population here we take the entire population so it is a period of time this is a point of time okay so we have we have an example here uh, on march uh, this is red uh, color are the uh, cases so uh, these 10 persons enter into a study at different point of time and they develop uh, this is a different point of time this person 9 develop this is a jam and the person second person this is uh, he entered the the k okay, under the study with the disease okay uh, the this person develop around between feb and march so point prevalence on march 1 so on march 1 we have 1 2 and 3 so 3 orange are there that is disease so on march 1st we have 3 cases out of 10 so 3 time 3 by 10 is a point prevalence that is 0.3 whereas the period prevalence of march to july so we need to start from here to start from here so how many are in between these two okay so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 okay so period prevalence of march 7 is 7 beta if we take point prevalence of july it will be 1 2 3 and 4 4 beta okay so like that and if we take this may we get only 1 2 and 3 so that is prevalence so denominator will be the total population or mid interval population whereas incidence is a number of new cases occurring in a population so there is always a period of time because we need to know how many diseases are happening in how many days or how many weeks or how many months so we need to know the speed of uh, disease occurrence so always we mention a period a time factor is there okay so two types are the cumulative and incident cumulative incidence and incidence rate incidence rate is the actual incidence which is also known as incidence density so this is another example in incidence we mention it as a person year okay so how many period or how many years the person is under risk that is person year you just see here so in person uh, year so the person number 10 starts from enter the study at second year and he develops a disease at 5 years so the risk was for 3 years so he constitute 3 person year and this 9th 8th 7th 6 all are entering study or they are being exposed from the year 0 okay so patient 9 has 6 years of risk but he didn't develop the disease but still he has 6 person year person 8 also has 6 person year once the person develop disease there is no risk okay because they develops a disease so we are checking only risk period here we you know the person starts by 3 year and for 3 years by end of 6 year study stopped so how many period or how many years the person is under risk that is what person year so incidence density 
number of new cases that is 1 2 3 and 4 4 by how many person here here 3 6 all we add we get total 46 here this black is death okay this person enters the study at year 1 but by year 5 he died still he was 4 here uh, he has 4 here uh, 4 person here so it was so incident density is 4 by 46.09 per year so cumulative incidents uh, similarly uh, it is a new cases but the denominator is uh, initial or mid-year population just like our prevalence only for incidence rate or incidence density we have denominator person time that is what we calculated here okay that is only for incidence rate or incidence density cumulative incidence is nothing but uh, uh, like prevalence we add uh, incidence plus period prevalence it's a little complicated but uh, it is uh, calculating a period okay and uh, for incidence we need to go for cohort study and for prevalence we need to have cross-sectional study because cross-sectional is a retrospective or asking the past history whereas cohort study we are taking uh, the new cases or we are going uh, towards the future okay so that is the difference between prevalence and incidence you can write if the question asks prevalence and incidence the table uh, would be great uh, to get marks next is bias bias is nothing but a systematic error in research between the exposure and disease basically we have three bias one is selection information and confronting so we have bias in case control and cohort study in case control we have selection bias that is prevalence incidence bias or which is known as selective survival so i will explain you with an uh, example of cancer uh, cancer is a chronic disease a patient starts the disease and he survives a lot of time if he gets a good treatment still uh, the natural history is very lengthier so when we start a study uh, we take patients who has disease for last five years and who develops a disease last year okay so the study includes incident cases that is a new cases and also prevalent cases that is a person with disease for many years of time and we ask questions to uh, these people and they respond in different way because the new cases uh, won't be having much to say whereas the prevalent cases or the people with disease for such a long time would um, answer by answer in a different way because he was experiencing this problem for a period of time so that problem creates a bias that is known as prevalence incidence bias when a study which includes both prevalent cases and incident cases incident cases nothing but new cases prevalent cases is nothing but old cases that is a disease for a quiet period of time so that is a selective survival bias but the person's survival is different if patient gets the treatment at earlier time he survives a lot of time if the patient receives the treatment at uh, the end of his natural history the person might not survive so this problem always comes with chronic diseases and admission rate bias is Bexon's uh, bias which is put forward by Joseph or noticed by Joseph Bexon that is when the study case control study is done at a hospital and to be very honest uh, most of the case control study uh, will be done uh, at hospitals only because the cases will be at hospital not in a general population so the entire uh, concept of uh, cases is not representing the general population so most of the time uh, the case control study the odds ratio one we get from case control study might be overestimated because the cases are not representative of general population because we won't find many cases in general population because cases would be at hospital and they come back to the general population after getting cured so that is admission rate bias because we have different uh, proportion of cases of same disease at hospital and in general population that is Bexon bias information bias is the uh, bias which is happening while collecting information so memory or recall bias in case control study we are asking patients about uh, their previous history the the information which happened to the patients last year or two years ago so patient would definitely have a uh, difficulty in recollecting all the things which uh, happened two years ago or three years ago so there will be lots of uh, misinformation or high chances of false information so that is memory or recall bias difficulty in recalling the information telescopic bias it is a, a psychological phenomena when we ask a question of a recent thing he might say 
the things which had happened to him or her very long ago that is a telescopic effect so when we look at a thing using a telescope that might be at a very closer uh, level so that kind of thing also happens when a patient recollects his answers and interviewers bias is a patient the interviewer is having a suspicion and he is when being uh, known the hypothesis he has a chance to uh, change the answer okay or in a way that uh, the uh, things goes in a hypothesis way because he is definitely doing to test the hypothesis so a person or an interviewer knows the hypothesis would definitely alter the or chances to alter the answers and hawthorne effect is observer bias it is a again psychological effect uh, hawthorne effect is uh, something like when we are being observed we try to uh, perform in a better way when we are uh, in a study or we know that we are being studied we uh, answer in a better way or answer in a way which helps the person to um, find out the or test the hypothesis so we always try to help the person uh, by altering the altering or we present ourselves in a better way so that is hawthorne effect when we are uh, being studied and the patient knows that he is being studied we alter the responses bias due to confounding or third variable bias this is a bias which happens in every study because we study two things basically independent variable and dependent variable we are studying coffee drinking causes lung cancer but there are many things which affects coffee drinking and lung cancer okay they are confounders or concealing variables they affect both independent and dependent variables so we need to include as many ex, uh, explaining or confounding variables in the study to reduce the overestimation otherwise the odds ratio we get will be very much high if we get odds ratio of 10 that says that person who drinks coffee uh, is having 10 times risk of having lung cancer uh, compared to the people who is not having the habit of drinking coffee but that is not true that is because many other variables are involved in the study uh, so the person who is uh, drinking coffee will be having a chance of smoking because they are linked always so this is not uh, been tested so we need to include uh, third variables so that uh, the actual effect of the variable would be expressed whereas in the bias in cohort study similarly the, it is a forward looking study so there will be chances of non consent bias or missing data bias the person who said yes at the beginning but he might refuse in later time and missing data bias that is is a follow up study so there are high chances of data missing because we need to follow up the person over a period of time so high chances of data missing then information bias like misclassification bias or diagnostic bias and similarly confounding bias also uh, can happen here but as a post hoc bias uh, we are doing a study and that is a cohort study for a very long period of time so at the end of the uh, study we are not getting the result we wanted so what we do is we do dredging on the data which is actually giving no result but we do more dredging more dredging and we get something which is useful for our study which is actually not true okay so that is post hoc bias we do dredging and we get a result we wanted uh blinding is uh three types so blinding is to avoid the uh, participant or investigator known which group are they belong to or uh, to mask the doctor or the investigator where the participants or which participants are receiving which drug uh that is blinding it avoids bias so randomized control trial or the trials always follow double blind or triple blind or single blind in single blind the participants would not be knowing which drug they are receiving double blind both investigator and participants are not knowing which drug uh, he is giving because the third person would give the drugs to the participants and triple blind the person who is doing this data analysis that is a statistician would also will not be knowing which group data he is analyzing that is blinding time trends comes in the descriptive epidemiology Uh, that is uh, disease with short term fluctuation periodic fluctuation long term fluctuation it has got uh, details in the chapter epidemiology chapter it is not very frequently asked but time trends it is a little confusing term so we don't get confused time trends is coming in descriptive epidemiology in describing the disease under time how the disease are getting fluctuated some are short term some diseases are periodic and some are long term diseases matching we already discussed uh, in case control study we have pair matching and group matching pair matching we know a person with this gender a person with this this gender but without disease 
Group matching is if we have 25% married, we select 25% unmarried. Odds ratio is nothing but the odds of exposure in cases by the odds of exposure in control. Okay, so we need to draw a contingency table exactly like this disease and no disease that is case and control should be on the x-axis, exposed and unexposed should be on the y-axis. So odds ratio is nothing but the cross product that is ADB, AD by BC. So odds ratio uh, gives uh, uh, that is if odds ratio is 5 that says that the control uh, or the cases the exposure in the cases uh, is 5 times the control that is if patient uh, with lung cancer uh, is having 5 times odds ratio to the person without lung cancer and smoking is the other variable means person who smokes uh, has 5 times chance of uh, developing this lung cancer compared to the person who doesn't smoke that is the odds ratio it is a uh, risk estimation in case control study whereas the relative risk is the actual risk it is the incidence of exposed incidence among exposed and incidence among unexposed this is the incidence a and c exposed is a plus b and unexposed is c plus d so a by exposed a by b c by unexposed c by d so incidence in exposed and incidence in unexposed so this also says that if a person if a study reports a risk of five relative risk of five a person with smoking habit would develop uh, lung cancer five times compared to a person who is not having the habit so the risk compared to the unexposed group whereas attributable risk is incidence among exposed minus incidence among non-exposed divided by incidence among exposed into 100 this uh, says the percentage of attribution to that particular causal factor suppose we get 30 percentage means if a, if a group of people 100 people smokes the 30 people would get the lung cancer and if we have attributable risk 70 percentage the 100 people is having the habit of smoking 70 out of this 100 would get the outcome or lung cancer that is attributable risk how much power the particular causal factor has Whereas population attributable risk is incidence in total population minus incidence among the non-exposed divided by the incidence of total population this is applicable in preventive uh, experiments if we remove the smoking from that population this percentage of people can be saved if this risk and this risk will be in uh, i mean uh, these two are in percentage uh, this attributable risk explains the power of a in causal factor but this says if we remove that particular causal factor from the population that is if we are uh, implementing a tobacco cessation program in a group of people we can save 30 percentage of death so if we get 40 i mean 40 percentage if we remove the causal factor or if removal of causal factor is nothing but uh, cessation or tobacco cessation or uh, changes in the habit so that uh, helps to understand the power of a uh, experiment or a preventive strategy First, we need to calculate the population attribute of risk. Okay, so that particular the causal factor is removed from the population. How much or how percentage of people can be saved? Now, the principles of epidemiology. We have four principles of epidemiology: that is, exact observation, correct interpretation, rational explanation, and scientific interpretation. We have the acronym: Every coffee requires sugar. So, principles of epidemiology. Earlier, we learned principles of primary healthcare that is, community participation, intersectoral coordination, equitable distribution, and appropriate technology. But this is principles of epidemiology. Again, we are having principles of health education in the next session. And tools of epidemiology rate, ratio, and proportion. Rate, we already seen incidence is a rate, death rate, birth rate, uh, over rate, run rate. So, rate is always having a time frame in the denominator, whereas a ratio. Uh, there is no connection between uh, numerator and denominator the male female ratio doctor population ratio proportion there is always connection with numerator and denominator that is 30 percentage 40 percentage incidence is rate whereas a proportion is prevalence prevalence is how many or people out of the population is having disease so prevalence is an example of proportion incidence is an example of rate so this is a difference between case control and cause study Case control it starts from effect to cause. This is cause to effect, that is, lung cancer to smoking. So, how many of the people with lung cancer, when without lung cancer, having the exposure, that is, smoking, and we take odds ratio here. We are starting with uh, smoking to lung cancer. So, this starts with disease, this starts with people exposed to the risk factor. 
and um, it involves very few subjects because already we have case just select the control and do study here it involves large number of subjects long follow-up delayed result it will give result very easily this is suitable for rare disease because it's already happened so we just need to take the control but this is not at all appropriate for rare disease because rare disease occurs rarely if we start the disease and we're waiting for those disease to occur that might not ever occur and we end up with losing all our money time and workforce so quad study is always uh, give result for very common diseases like cardiac diseases or uh, blood pressure diseases lifestyle diseases which is happening to everyone and this is giving odds ratio this is relative risk and attributable risk this is inexpensive this is very very expensive so that are uh, the difference between case control and cause study okay so that was all about epidemiology i was not explaining everything but i think to an extent i explained uh, so you need to uh, write the steps of uh, descriptive study analytical study and experimental study with flow chart to get good marks and uh, when you're writing case control and cohort always include this uh, table and uh, this rate ratio proportion is always asked but mostly asked question is prevalence and incidence it's very confusing thing when it comes to types of incidence and types of prevalence so if you pay attention uh, for a little period you will understand both prevalence and incidence in depth and bias is always uh, asked question so make sure that uh, you write both case control bias and cohort bias rest are easy so this is very very important not just for exam purpose in your future also uh, you will definitely be benefited if you study well epidemiology. Okay, so next session we have third session. It was about uh, it's about epidemiology of dental caries, periodontal disease, and oral cancer. It's a quite simple chapter, but questions are asked frequently. So I'll come up with this part three in my next session. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in Dentistry and more. Today we have the continuation of our question paper discussion, Public Health Dentistry. So we are into the part 4 of the 6 series sessions. So today's uh, discussion topics are uh, health education and promotion, nutrition and oral health, school oral health program and fluorides. Uh, among these four, health education is very important and fluorides. Uh, school oral health programs and nutrition and oral health, uh, they are not very important but questions, uh, short notes and short essays used to come but these two are uh, fluorides and health education very frequently asked long essay question. So last three sessions hope you had watched it, uh, it was about uh, the first uh, nine chapters those includes uh, it was regarding the epidemiology of peroneal disease, renal caries, oral cancer before we had uh, the first session it was about uh, the introduction to dentistry, public health and dental public health, water purification, waste management and the second session a single chapter was taken it was general epidemiology now we are into the fourth session so we'll start with the first chapter of fourth session that is health education and promotion the most common question asked was uh, define dental health education then the principles uh, barriers and uh, add a note on audiovisual aids so definition uh, you must write the definition that is it is a process that informs motivates and helps people to adopt and maintain healthy practices and lifestyle which advocates the changes as needed to facilitate this goal and conducts the professional training and research the same end so better you choose uh, this definition by national conference on preventive medicine in usa uh, two or three other definitions are there, but this is well accepted one. So this is the most commonly asked uh, section of health education that is principles of health education. Uh, we have 13 principles. Uh, the first one is credibility. The information should be credible and we should create interest and it should be a participating that is our audience should be participating in the process and we should motivate the uh, participants and the level of understanding is important that is the comprehension we should talk or we should provide information at a level where the participants or where the people understand it then we have reinforcement uh, it is a principle which refers to the repetition needed in health education so we need to uh, give repetition uh, this can be done at regular intervals and this helps people to understand new ideas or practices in a better way so this is also known as the booster doses then learning by doing it is like a principle uh, which is based on the famous chinese proverb if i hear i forget if i see i remember if i do i know next uh, we have known to unknown so before the start of any health education uh, the health educator should find out how much the people already know then give the new knowledge so known to unknown so we are providing a new knowledge so we need to understand how much they already know and then provide new knowledge then uh, the setting an example that is the health educator should follow what he preaches he should set an example to other people and uh, if uh, suppose if we take an example if he uh, talks about uh, smoking cessation and the people find the health educator himself smokes after the program that is uh, completely against the ethics so he should set an example then good human relationship that is health educator should have good personal qualities and he should be very friendly with the people and he should be a kind and sympathetic uh, a person 
so the people will understand better because they tend to listen to people who feel very uh, friendly then regarding the feedback uh, we should always take feedback uh, if because uh, we will be knowing if any modifications is required so we can uh, do the modifications at the later part of the uh, our presentation or maybe the next program then soil seed sower is like uh, soil is uh, the people seed is the information so is a health educator so this is very commonly asked principles of health education you need to explain a little bit about each principle then health education methods we have three uh, parameters that is individual approach where the one-to-one approach uh, that is uh, just like uh, giving a, a counseling session uh, or uh, maybe a, uh, just like in a college setup uh, you can imagine how a, a student is uh, giving demonstration a single student is giving a demonstration or getting information from the teacher uh, on a one-to-one -one basis so that is uh, very effective but the problem is its reach is very less because uh, we are uh, giving just for a one person so individual approach is not always acceptable but sometimes it is very helpful uh, for example like uh, counseling sessions but as a group uh, approach is an effective way of educating the community uh, only thing is we need to find out the suitable media the first uh, and we are also the mass approach it is reaching very uh, big population but it's not very effective so we'll uh, look into the group health education method chalk and talk method that is the first one the lecture type it is uh, carefully prepared oral presentation uh, of facts and thoughts so usually uh, it should have uh, less than 30 people and the length should be 15 to 20 minutes but the problem with this talk and talk it is always a one-way communication learning is more of a passive in nature then we have a symposium a symposium is nothing but a series of speeches on a selected topic each speaker uh, present an aspect of a topic but there is no discussion between the speakers at the end uh, the audience may ask questions and panel discussion is a little different. A panel of uh, four to eight members sit and discuss a topic in front of an audience. Uh, the panel members uh, discuss here. Okay, in symposium, there is no discussion between members. Panel discussion, it is a discussion between the panel members. At the end, audience are allowed to ask questions. Uh, whereas demonstration, uh, it is uh, like the procedure is carried out step by step in front of an audience so it has uh, got a high motivational uh, value and the audience can then carry out the procedure themselves uh, uh, without the expert help then uh, we have workshops workshop it consists of a series of meetings uh, with emphasis on individual work with the help of a resource person so what is happening here is the total workshop is divided into small groups and each group will select a chairman and this individual work solve a part of the problem and then finally the total problem uh, whereas a flash mob or the older role play okay so this is like a situation is dramatized to make communication more effective uh, it is the more uh, newer version is a flash mob where we suddenly attract uh, audience attention by playing music and dancing in public place so people will be gathered to watch the performance at the end we provide uh, information conferences and seminars are like uh, annually uh, it is conducted uh, with a common theme and uh, it can be conducted by the associations, NGOs. Uh, group discussion is more like uh, 6 to 12 people and they sit in a circular fashion. There will be a group leader who initiates the subject, prevents uh, side conversation 
बट द प्रॉब्लम इज द अनईक्वल पार्टिसिपेशन में आपका इफ पर्सन इज शाई एंड सम विल बी वेरी एक्टिव एंड डोमिनेटिंग सो दैट इज अबाउट ग्रुप हेल्थ एजुकेशन मेथड एंड मास मीडिया इज अ थर्ड मेथड मास अप्रोच a very large number of people can be reached just like our social media uh, the whatsapp facebook instagram youtube twitter all our social media can reach millions uh, within seconds but it is obviously a one way communication so this was all uh, the older types of mass media television radio newspapers posters this is just taken from the textbook but we have a lots of newer ones just like uh, social media facebook whatsapp and instagram now we are into the barriers of communication there are four barriers one is psychological physiological environmental and cultural barriers psychological is nothing but the person is not able to uh, receive the information because of emotional problem uh, depression or neurosis uh, we can um, help the person with uh, special methods Uh, we can motivate we can do counseling uh, physiological barriers a patient has any problem with self expression hearing seeing understanding uh, we can uh, think of an alternative method depending upon the patient's barrier environmental barrier the location where we are providing health education where this problem of noise vision and congestion if anything that sort of uh we can uh correct it then cultural barriers like habits beliefs customs attitudes some culture some uh, uh religions might object some kind of information uh acceptance there is lots of problem with some religion and some cultures they are not very uh convenient uh to be accepted i mean for to accept uh, health education uh then we have again uh, the fine health health education and propaganda uh, describe various methods of dental health education individual group and mass approach which already we seen and now the new term we got here is propaganda propaganda is nothing but a publicity campaign what the uh, uh, people they do at uh, the parties the common uh, political parties what they do at election campaign that's what propaganda without any evidence they just put up uh, slogans they just put up some plans so that is propaganda and propaganda started in the uh, hitler period he has a propaganda chief joseph gibbles he started this uh, making up stories out of thin air so that was a uh, propaganda uh, so we have some difference between health education and propaganda health education knowledge skills are actively acquired but in propaganda knowledge is instilled in the mind of people health education uh, make people think for themselves propaganda prevent thinking by ready made slogans this is uh, discipline primitive desires but to stimulate primitive desire then health education is always called to reason but this is to emotion and this is an active process and this is spoon fed the process is behavior center and this is process is information center this dif- this develop reflective behavior health education as propaganda develops now this is reflective behavior and this is reflexive behavior so propaganda is always a very bad for people because they don't think they just accept whatever they hear uh next uh, is a question which came like this prepare a television talk for improving oral health for school children so you can apply the principles of health education and uh, the talk which uh, the content of talk uh, for aiming school health children so you can mention about the prevention of dental caries how to brush the brushing techniques how the dental caries happens and why you need to preserve the tooth till the exfoliation state and how many times you should brush and you need to uh, justify all your statement why you are saying uh, twice uh, brushing 
why you are saying using a toothbrush why you're saying using toothpaste you need to justify it you need to provide proper scientific information then only they will listen and you need to demonstrate uh, all the brushing techniques the phones technique or the modified mask technique so you can write under uh, the principles of health education and the content then uh, define health education describe the various methods of health communication so communication is basically three types a one way two way verbal non verbal formal and informal so one way is just like sender to receiver but the problem here is knowledge is imposed it is authoritative learning there is no feedback little audience participation whereas two way communication uh, there is always participation from both the sender and receiver learning is active and democratic it is more likely to influence the behavior whereas the verbal and non verbal uh, verbal is a traditional and non verbal is a bodily movement and facial expression even when you are teaching something don't just stand at one place you need to uh, make gestures hand gestures your body should speak so formal communication is follow lines of authority informal means conversing with friends or colleagues short essays uh, we already seen audio visual aids uh, we know which is audio audio aids visual aids and the combination health promotion is a, a last uh, question which might come so it is nothing but helping the people so that uh, helping in a way so that the people uh, has more uh, knowledge about their health so that they understand their health better so that they maintain their health better uh, they stay away from diseases by adopting uh, newer uh, health promotion measures so these are the principles of health promotion like building a health e public policy uh, we should create supportive environment for a better health we should strengthen the community action to promote health uh, we should uh, help the people to develop better skills to have a good health and we should reorient the health services to the needy people next we have the chapter uh, which is not very important nutrition and health uh, nutrition health uh, basic questions are define nutrition and the importance of nutrition in oral health nutrition we know it is a process by which an individual takes in and utilizes the food that is what the patient consumes nutrition what is taken from the diet so nutrition and dental caries is uh, you know how it affects pre eruptive affects post eruptive nutrition and malocclusion periodontal disease and oral cancer so diet is what i said like food eaten by individual nutrition is what it consumed out of uh, diet so nutrition and pre eruptive effect there is always we know how it affects the uh, uh, if we take the tooth Uh, vitamin A, vitamin B, calcium, phosphorus, all minerals and vitamins should be there for proper uh, maturation of pre-eruptive maturation. If it is not there, there will be uh, hypomineralized area. Similarly, post-eruptive, uh, we need to provide fluoride, calcium. So proper maturation requires ions, uh, minerals, nutrition. If proper nutrition is not there, proper bone growth will not happen. Proper the heart tissues uh, means there will be chances of crowding periodontal disease also for gum health uh, for proper uh, nutrition uh, proper uh, gentival health we need uh, good nutrients vitamin c is very essential similarly all nutrients are very essential vitamin b complex so nutrition and oral cancer so there are some agents which prevent oral cancer so agent Uh, which causes oral cancer so you need to explain a bit about all of this so one question was epidemiological studies on diet and dental caries so this is regarding diet and dental caries from these studies it has been proven that diet is a positive factor for dental caries so first one was wipom study 1945 to 55 it was in sweden uh, started in 1938 uh, this was uh, evaluation period it is to determine whether carbohydrate affects the formation of cavities uh, it had seven distinct groups and given in different quantities uh, and finally they found out 
the carbohydrate is a consecutive thing for dental caries then the second study was hope foot house study uh, in new south wales between 1947 to 62 the children followed a strict vegetarian diet which was low in sugar and dental caries experience was lower compared to the children of same age and socioeconomic background in new south wales because they were provided with a vegetarian diet with low sugar compared to the other children uh, two sugar study which was mainly on fructose xylitol uh, xylitol it was done by sheenan and mckinnon 1970 where xylitol uh, proven to be uh, caries inhibiting where the xylitol group showed very less cavity trista dagon her study it is a remote rocky island in south atlantic island so these inhabitants were of European origin because of the volcanic eruption. The islanders were evacuated to England between 61 to 63. So prior to 1940, their diet was very low in sugar. But since 1940, the island store, they started selling sugar and sugar containing food. So uh, the results of the survey show very caries, uh, low caries experience in 1937. But after that, there is a deterioration in the dental health because from 1940 they started uh, selling sugar uh, next study was hereditary fructose intolerance is a rare hereditary disease caused by an inborn error of metabolism and uh, these patients do not possess uh, the uh, enzyme uh, which is required for the ingestion of uh, fructose or sucrose. So they uh, experience very low caries. And World War II study, it was done in Japan. There is a strict rationing of sugar during these war times, which led to the decline of DMFT. Okay. So the DMFT was very less in 1950 compared to the 1940. Then uh, short essay again nutrition classification of nutrition nutrients and role of trace elements. So trace elements are copper, copper ion, zinc, phosphorus, fluoride. So these are like formation of bone, teeth, coagulation of blood, contraction of muscle, milk production. It has got uh, many roles. Nutrition and dental caries we already discussed. pre repti effects, post repti effects then sugar substitute they are artificial sweetness they are basically two type nutritive and non-nutritive uh, mechanism of action this xylitol uh, they reduces they are actually polyalcohol this bacteria cannot act on this bacteria uh, i mean uh, this sugar so they are more like caries resistant they can uh, provide much reduction of caries because it reduces the addition of microorganism to the teeth surface and also reduces the acid production potential and it has the ability to promote remineralization by increasing the salivary flow when used as chewing gums school oral health programs uh, short essays uh, commonly asked question is incremental dental care and uh, comprehensive dental care okay so before that one question was about the objectives of school dental health program so these are the objectives you know to help every school child to appreciate the importance of healthy mouth uh, and stimulate the development of resources to make dental care available to all children, uh, increase the observance of dental health practices including personal care, professional care, proper diet, oral habits. So all listed are the objectives and the components of our school oral health program, uh, there should be a good a community school relationship between uh, school and the community and they should conduct dental inspection frequently and there should be a dental health education camps after that they should perform programs like tooth brushing program fluoride mouth rinsing program fluoride tablet program school water and other nutrition programs then there is most important question 
incremental and comprehensive dental care incremental dental care and comprehensive dental care are two concept incremental one is providing uh, health care in an increment fashion that is periodic care uh, they are treated at the earliest time and uh, in a such a way that there is no accumulation we should treat the uh, patients in a step by step manner because uh, we are provided with less fund so we need to uh, treat uh, the group of people where it's the earliest stage disease are at the earliest stage uh, but the problem it is very time consuming and uh, restorative dentistry is uh, more time consuming on a piecemeal basis uh, because we are not uh, taking whole of the population in a single time there is a comprehensive we are providing all accumulated dental needs at the time of population the program we are uh, treating all the people and all their dental needs then we put the people on a maintenance care but in incremental we take just a part of this population or a part of the school if you are going in school we just take one class at a time then after some period we take the next class and provide the maintenance care for the previously done similarly we complete the whole population or whole school but in comprehensive we do this entire thing in a single time and later on we provide the maintenance care so blanket referral is a concept it is like uh, all children it is to make sure that the student uh, is getting treatment so in this program all children are given referral cards to first they have to uh, the dental health nurse or the uh, dentist or whoever checks the student at uh, school uh, write down the dental problems of the student and that card has to uh, go to the home and then subsequently to the dentist so all has to sign it okay then after a period of time the class teacher can check for the referral card okay if the student has got signature from the parent and the dentist and he can uh, make sure that uh, all the students get the treatment if somebody is not get the signature means he has not taken the card to the dentist or the parent so we can uh, monitor those children and do the necessary action so this is a blanket referral concept so next is a theta program it is a acronym for teenage health education teaching assistant it is developed by national foundation for the prevention of oral disease uh, for the u.s department of health and welfare so it came twice and dental personnel train high school children and they train the elementary school children so first dentist comes to the school and they train high school children after that this high school children train the elementary or younger group goals uh, like to give knowledge and skill there should be a good rapport between these two groups of children and introduce them to career opportunities whereas sharp is a school health additional referral program this is motivation through home visits started in philadelphia a first motivation of parents to correct children to community resources so district nurses are the main in charge okay so these nurses visit uh, the houses and meet the parents and uh, motivate them okay if uh, motivate them regarding the health of their child if the parent is not at home they make the phone calls so always one to one interaction establish a better rapport between home and school and they will be well aware about their uh, kids problem so there are other pro uh, programs regarding the school health uh, one is head start it is the us department of health and human services to assist the children of lower income then learning about your oral health it was started by american dental association in 1971 so it is more to like education of school children then tattle tooth is by texas statewide preventive dentistry program uh, using dental hygienists to they uh, help the students to understand about the oral health its problem and how to prevent it then escort dental demonstration in denmark the minnesota health department arranged demonstration and education programs in school the north carolina statewide preventive dental program using 
school water fluoridation and mouth rinse program so all our school dental programs all were done at schools uh, whereas coming to the indian scenario first program was started in baroda in 1909 there was no actual program but it was uh, believed that the program was uh, in any kind started in uh, baroda city now the vadodara city previous vadodara now is baroda so we had uh, one program that is called gates bright smile bright future it was started by or it was conducted in india and implemented in india by indian dental association they take classes for students now we are into the most important chapter that is fluorides so so many essays uh, used to be asked from this chapter the uh, one essay is define defluoridation classify the methods of uh, defluoridation uh, so we have uh, lots of uh, technique uh, for defluoridation the most common one is nalgonda technique it was developed by national environmental engineering uh, institute in nagpur in 1974 by naval ketal and it was reported by bulsu in 1988 so this is more like a water purification process the steps are like flocculation, sedimentation and filtration. Similarly, there will be rapid mix for a period of 30 to 60 seconds, flocculation for 10 to 15 minutes, uh, then filtration and sedimentation. So all these processes are also there in our water purification. So same steps we also follow, but uh, the technique is different. So there are other methods. Uh, uh, before that, the salient features are there is no regeneration of media, there is no handling of caustic soda and adaptable for domestic use, it is simple, little wastage of water, no energy needed, minimum mechanical and electrical equipment. There are other methods, uh, they are not usually asked but you must be knowing. Uh, they are ion exchange process or adsorption that is uh, uh, carbion, uh, defluoron 1, uh, it uses sulfonated sawdust uh, mixed with 2% alum solution defluoron 2 uh, it is sulfonated coal using aluminum solution and um, there are few other methods uh, like uh, domestic uh, defluoridation uh, using uh, the drumstick seeds uh, so many other uh, people use for defluoridation of water so most commonly this nalgonda technique will be asked so you need to draw a picture and write about it then second question is define water fluoridation discuss the different methods of water fluoridation how fluorides are added into the uh, water okay so it is not about the systemic water fluoridation methods that is the next essay question we'll come to that so this is asked about uh, the water fluoridation equipments basically so if you are very confused you can write both answers like water fluoridation equipments and water fluoridation i mean community water systemic water fluoridation methods so water fluoridation is defined as controlled adjustment of the concentration of fluoride in a community water supply to achieve a maximal carry separation that is one ppm so we have three equipments basically one is the saturator system where the four percentage saturated solution of sodium fluoride and uh, which is injected at the desired concentration of the water distribution source with the help of a pump uh, so dry feeder system it is uh, sodium fluoride or silica fluoride in the form of powder is introduced into a dissolving basin with the aid of an automatic mechanism to ensure the maintenance of correct supply uh, that is a dry feeder system whereas a solution feeder system where the volumetric pump uh, used in here so hydrofluorosilicic acid that has been added okay so that was about the uh, equipments for water fluoridation uh, now uh, we have the systemic water fluoridation commonly community water fluoridation uh, school water fluoridation so only in community water fluoridation we uh, add 1 ppm because it is 24 by 7 it is coming to our home uh, we tend to drink a lot of water uh, but in uh, salt, milk and school water fluoridation, 
uh, we provide 4 to 5 ppm because we tend to consume very less of salt, milk and school water fluoridation. I mean school water also the student tend to drink one or two glasses max. So we need to get a uh, net effect of 1 ppm so we provide more amount of ppm so that he gets a net effect of 1 ppm. So regarding the salt fluoridation it was uh, introduced by Westby in 1948 that is sodium fluoride or potassium fluoride it was in Switzerland and they started selling uh, since 1955. So it has got two process that how it is added to uh, or production of flow data salt by batch processing or continuous processing. Uh, this uh, batch processing is nothing but fixed amount of fluoride compound. Uh, mostly it is sodium or potassium fluoride is added to the fixed amount of refined salt. Uh, whereas a continuous process uh, in large production of plants where continuous processing of salt is very common the procedure is often to spray a dosed concentrated fluoride solution through a nozzle onto the salt which is passing through a conveyor belt this is a continuous process okay whereas a milk fluoridation uh, is addition of measured quantity of fluoride to a bottle or packaged milk it was introduced by Ziegler uh, it was a uh, project of Swiss city uh, winter third in 1953 uh, whereas in 1971 dr. Edgar Borough established a borough foundation okay so in England uh, so it was aimed to promote the use of milk uh, which contains fluoride so milk is also additional uh, nutritional uh, benefit for the kids okay uh, fluoride tablets drops and lozenges so this is also a systemic fluoridation so we were talking about systemic fluoridation which is consumed to uh, uh, like our systemic circulation it will enter to blood so if the patient's drinking water has less than 0.3 and the patient age is 6 to 3 years uh, we need to provide an additional 0.25 gram okay and 3 to 6 year uh, we should provide 0.5 and 6 to 16 year we should provide 1 gram of milliliter fluoride uh, and it changes according to the level of uh, fluoride in the drinking water if the patient is already having more than 0.6 ppm we need not to add any amount of fluoride further uh, next question was define dental fluorosis and write about Dane's fluorosis index. Dane's fluorosis index was put forward by 1934. Later, it was corrected in 1942. So, it has got a uh, six scale uh, ordinary scale, normal, questionable, very mild, mild, moderate, and severe. So, you need to write about each uh, category. Uh, then, what is safely tolerated dose and certainly lethal dose for fluoride? So this is also known as STD and CLD. So safely tolerable dose is 8 to 16 milligram of fluoride per kilogram uh, and certainly lethal dose it is 30 to 64. This is one fourth STD is one fourth of CLD. So acute dose is 5 gram. So if you consume 5 gram uh, there will be death and acute and chronic toxicity differ. Acute means rapid excessive ingestion of fluoride. So there will be nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, increased salivation. Uh, chronic is like fluorosis, dental and skeletal uh, that comes in toxicity. Now we have the topical application. So before we were seeing the systemic application, now the topical application commonly we have Nutsen's technique, Muller's technique and um, uh, Brutwall's solution. Nutsen's technique, uh, sodium fluoride 20 gram per 1 liter of water. Uh, it is uh, applied in a 4 minutes time for an age group of 3, 7, 11 and 13. Uh, for a 1 week interval, we are applying 4 times in this age group. So, total 16 times. So, um, application is same. The procedure is same. We need to polish the teeth, upper and lower are isolated with the cotton rolls. Then apply it for 4 minutes. Why 4 minutes means? 4 minutes will be saturated. And there will be chalking of phenomena. Muller solution is more like uh, twice a year. The sodium fluoride total 16 times we will be applying uh, one week interval in each year 3, 7, 11, 13, where this age group is important because 
and this age group there is eruption of new or permanent teeth okay uh, three uh, there is eruption of uh, not permanent teeth uh, newer teeth uh, deciduous molars seven means central incisor and molars then 11 and 13 canines premolars so all has to be protected for uh, I mean uh, recent erupted teeth has uh, lots of porosity it takes two to three years for to have a complete post eruptive mineralization so till that time this teeth has to be protected from the attack so newly erupted teeth should be given fluoride so molar solution will be applied twice a year preparation is 0.8 gram in 10 ml water this should be in a plastic container and freshly prepared in short notes the APF application so brood bowl solution so 20 gram of sodium fluoride is dissolved in 1 liter of 0.1 m phosphoric acid then we add 50 percentage of hydrofluoro uh, fluoride acid then adjust the pH 3 and fluoride concentration 1.23 so it can be used as gel when we adjust the pH 4 to 5 so similarly we need to apply it for 4 minutes it is basically a trade technique Tray technique and paint on technique is paint on is which is apply just like painting. Tray technique means we have preformed trays, we apply the material in trays and apply it on teeth. So, the mechanism option there will be an intermediate product known as dicalcium phosphate dihydrate. And, and there is no staining, uh, in, uh, staining is happen in with this one that is molar solution disadvantage is a sore and bitter taste okay then we have fluoride varnish uh, first developed by schmidt in europe uh, fluoride varnish there is two types duraphate and fluor protector this is 27000 ppm and this is around 7000 so what happens is when fluoride is applied there will be formation of uh, fluoroapatite and fluorox fluorohydroxyapatite so the procedure is same uh, chalking of phenomena which comes with uh, sodium fluoride application when we sodium fluoride application happens at one point uh, the formation of calcium fluoride happens and this formation prevents further diffusion of sodium fluoride and there will be complete stoppage of uh, the diffusion of fluoride so that is known as chalking of effect this is happens in sodium fluoride next uh, short note is show leather survey or 22 city studies this is a little confusing because we have one 21 city study also show leather survey both are done by trendly estrain in 1931 it is to determine the extent and severity of mortal level he surveyed in 22 cities okay of 10 states in usa around 5 8 2 4 children and he found out high concentration of fluoride directly related to mottling uh, mottling is widespread in more than 3 ppm area and discrete pitting was seen in more than 4 ppm area mild dull chalky white in 2.5 to 3 ppm and there was no mottling at 1 ppm this is shoe leather survey because uh, it, there was a lots of walking involved so it is not a shoe leather this is 22 city study whereas 21 city study same author trend phd 21 cities of four state this is 22 states of 10 states of usa around 7 to 5 7 children this is around 5 8 to 4 so it was like the relationship of dental caries and fluoride the inverse relationship and they found out maximum caries reduction at 0 0.7 to 1.2 ppm now the mechanism of uh, fluoride in caries prevention so the first one is increased enamel resistance that is reduction in enamel solubility because of the fluoride appetite crystal formation increased rate of post eruptive maturation that is the deposition of fluoride into this hypomineralized area is promoted with the presence of fluoride remineralization of incipient lesion white spot remineralization is possible then this inference with microorganism they alter the ph of bacterial enzyme interference then modification of tooth morphology the slightly uh, smaller tooth will be uh, formed and shallower fissure will be uh, formed with the help of fluoride now we have water fluoridation studies you need to write just like this okay you don't write in big big paragraph this is 
uh, well uh, enough to get uh, good marks okay so first one is the grand rapids muskegon in 1945 experimental city was grand rapid muskegon control city duration 615 evaluation happened in 1953 carries reduction 50 percentage newburgh kingston this is a experimental newburgh kingston control duration 10 years carries reduction 23.5 to 13.9 branford sarnia stratford Experimental Brantford, Sarnia Control City, whereas Stratford was a natural control, duration 17 years, carries reduction 55. Evanston North Park, Evanston Experimental City, Oak Park Control City, duration 14 years, carries reduction 49. Teal Columberg, Teal was experimental, Columberg Control, duration 13 years, carries reduction 58. If it was asked for a short note or short essay, this much information is pretty much enough okay you don't write in a big big paragraph just write this four or five points on each okay so that was all about uh, the uh, session four we discussed fluorides health education uh, nutrition and school oral health program where the fluoride is the most important one systemic fluoration topical fluoration fluoride toxicity and defluoration will be asked and many many Short notes like fluoridation studies, caries prevention mechanism, 21 city, shoe leather survey, chalking off, uh, fluoride varnish, uh, APF, this uh, Woodward solution, uh, Muller solution, Nutsons technique. So many questions will be there. So next session, uh, we are having uh, chapters like uh, Pit and Fisher sealants, a traumatic respiratory treatment survey procedures planning and evaluation and dental entices okay so after that we'll be having one more session so by part six we'll be winding up question paper discussion of public health dentistry so these were uh, uh, very comprehensive uh, explanation of each question uh, if you don't get much time to prepare uh, notes and if you don't get enough time to study I think this much points will get you marks for passing the exam and I don't say that you will get very high marks but it is quite enough to get a 50 percentage or 55 to 60 percentage rest you need to prepare your own notes uh, you need to uh, refer the textbooks or the notes which is given by your teachers but this will be a rapid review uh, you can watch all these uh, videos one by one or as a single video i'll be uploading all six parts in a six uh, i mean single video uh, after all six uh, videos been uploaded so that will be just like a rapid revision because it includes almost 90 95 percentage of the question which has been asked for past seven to ten years so i'll come up with the uh, part five in my next session thank you Hello everyone, welcome back to the continuation of question paper discussion, public health industry. We are into part 5. So this uh, part includes pit and fissure sealants, a traumatic uh, restorative treatment, survey procedures, planning and evaluation, finally the dental indices. Uh, out of these 5 topics, survey procedures are very important. Uh, the question long essay every two years a long essay will be a survey procedure it is nothing but an extension of epidemiology the way we conduct a survey the steps in survey are the uh, important thing in survey procedures epidemiology is uh, nothing but uh, how to 
uh, scientifically conduct a study to control uh, a disease to uh, the study the disease and control the same disease uh, whereas survey is nothing but the collection of data using any method so survey is uh, a part of epidemiology also because epidemiological studies are observational experimental so in all methods we can apply survey so survey is uh, just but uh, collection of data using any methods so we'll start with pit and fish assailants it's very easy topic usually a uh, short essay or short note will be asked from this chapter so we know it is to seal the pits and uh, fishes uh, so that uh, it will uh, act as a protective layer uh, which prevents the access of or which blocks the access of uh, caries producing bacteria from the source of nutrients and uh, we have classification of pit and fissure sealants uh, it is not the pit and fissures pit and fissures are i type u type v type k type they are classification of uh, fissures but this is about the sealants the most common classification is based on polymerization method that is first to fourth generation they are first generation is based on uv light then self cure or chemical one then the visible light and fourth generation is fluoride releasing uh, we have resin system that is bismuth and urethane acrylate and depending on the presence of filler uh, filled and semi filled and depending on the color clear and tinted so steps are very easy uh, to write you just need to imagine the procedure uh, in any uh, composite restoration so it is like cleaning the tooth isolation enamel etching application of sealant curing inspection revaluation cleansing and uh, the final polishing using a pumice and water now we have a short note which is known as preventive uh, resin restoration so the pit and fissure sealant is actually not a restoration it is a sealant it is a non invasive procedure we are doing it on a natural tooth which is likely to uh, have a caries in a future period so we are cutting the risk but preventive resin restoration is a restoration so it is uh, the minimal approach uh, compared to the uh, conventional amalgam so this resin is placed in caries area and seal uh, it from the oral environment so we have three types type a type b and type c type a it comprises just deep pits and fissures so caries is limited to enamel so we can uh, create a simple small preparation and use a uh, unfilled resin or sealant whereas type b is little more deep so we need to uh, restore with some uh, filler because it needs uh, more power because uh, the material has to withstand the occlusal forces so we add resin with a filler whereas type c is very deep so we might need to add a base for that because it is reaching to dentine so resin layer followed by the composite should be uh, used as for the restoration so the same uh, steps you can write profile axis isolation then acid etching washing drying and all the restoration next is the most uh, important short note a traumatic restorative treatment uh, this was uh, started by yo franken in 2012 this is a minimally invasive approach to prevent dental caries and stopping its further progression so two basic principles are there the first one is using hand instruments because it was started in areas where the electricity was not available so the first principle using hand instrument second is material using material which sticks to the tooth that is a chemical bonding so we use commonly gic because we don't have curing light uh, and we cannot use amalgam because it needs uh, extensive cavity cutting so we can use it without electricity and without much equipment so 
uh, it has to be naturally i mean chemically uh, bonding to the true structure so gis is the most apt one so these are the, the two principles now let's see what are the indications so it's commonly used in small cavities and which are accessible by hand instrument and most commonly this is a method public health program setups but if it is a deep cavity with swelling fistula or pulp exposed uh, we cannot use it uh, advantage is it's a biological approach which has a, a less trauma and it can be practiced anywhere with simple infection control and it is very cost effective so these are the instruments we need to use for art that is mouth mirror exploit tweezer the main thing is spoon excavator and hatchet cover mixing pad and spatula so procedure is same for everyone i mean uh, for prr and everything only thing is we don't apply h and all rest all are same uh, arrange a good working environment hygiene control caries removal conditioning mixing and restoring the cavity now we are into the most important chapter that is the survey procedures so the question will be like this define survey discuss the details of various steps and sometimes an additional question of pathfinder survey and index age group will be there so survey is nothing but an investigation in which the information is systematically collected so this is a key part where the information will be collected uh, without any experimental method so surveys uh, anything which collects information is a survey it can be a descriptive study can be analytical study uh, like case control cohort even we take information in the experimental study public opinion uh, surveys so everything is a survey so these are the steps you need to elaborate uh about these steps that is uh, establishing the objectives then designing the investigation then selecting sample that is most crucial part after that uh, conducting examination then we need to analyze the data uh, after that uh, reaching to a conclusion and finally uh, we are publishing the result so these uh, seven steps you need to write after that you can uh, write little bit about uh, each step uh, that is the step one uh, which is uh, the establishing the objectives so it means uh, the investigator uh, he must be absolutely clear about the objective of investigation okay it can be either starter in the form of a hypothesis which is to be tested or objective uh, may be stated by describing what is to be measured so the starting point of a study is a expression of a null hypothesis that says that uh, there is no uh, effect or there is no relationship between two things which we are going to test uh, the second thing is designing the uh, investigation we can opt a descriptive study or analytical study so that is the second part uh, third part is a selecting sample so we can select the sample using any sampling technique okay so that is uh, coming in next slides then we need to conduct the examination uh, using uh, our instruments uh, then uh, we have uh, analyzing the data using a statistical method and drawing to a conclusion and finally publishing the result okay the second question uh, this is very important uh, sometimes the survey procedures will be along with this pathfinder survey so pathfinder survey is a method uh, to collect um, data and it uses stratified cluster sampling and it includes most important population subgroup it has two uh, types one is uh, pilot and pilot pathfinder then there is a national pathfinder so pilot survey which includes only one or two index age groups uh, usually 12 years or one other age group and it is a pilot survey so it is having minimal data whereas a national pathfinder survey it includes most of the population subgroup it includes three of the age groups uh, the age groups we are going to see in next slides 
which is actually suitable suitable for planning and monitoring okay this is uh, suitable for uh, to commence the planning okay then uh, sampling sites usually chosen so as to provide information on population groups likely to have different levels of oral disease so we need to take samples from cities small towns and including all ethnic groups so this is the index age group i was talking about we have five index age group uh, one is five year then 12 year 15 year uh, 35 to 45 uh, 44 and 65 to uh, 74 so five year is the uh, age of interest in relation to caries level in primary dentition uh, and this five year Im is important because it is a age at which children begin the primary school okay then 12 year is important because it is generally at which children leave primary school and is the last age at which a sample may be obtained easily through the school system so it is also known as a global indicator age group for dental caries in 15 years uh, it is the age that the permanent teeth have been exposed to oral environment for three to nine years and this is also important for the assessment of periodontal disease indicators in adolescence and 35 to 44 year is a standard monitoring group uh, for health condition of adults so full effect of dental caries the le level of severe periodontal disease uh, all can be monitored uh, 65 to 74 year this age group has become more important with the changes in age distribution and increases in lifespan uh, that are occurring. D data for this group are needed for both planning appropriate care for the elder group. So these five are the index age group. Okay. So now we are into the sampling method. We have uh, basically two types of sampling, probability and non-probability. Probability means it's uh, difficult to conduct, but it is the ideal one because it ensures uh, each participant's probability to be in the study. Okay, so if uh, 100 participants are there and we are going to take 10 out of this 100, all 100 participants have equal chance of being that sample or being that 10 but ultimately we take only 10 but still that chance is there but in non-probability that chance is not there so 100 students and we are taking 10 not every student has a chance to be in the study because it is a non-probability sample so let's see one by one simple random uh, the application is small homogeneous uh, so what is happening here is it is you now commonly done by lottery system and table of random numbers So this is how it is we randomly pick Three out of this 16 we randomly pick so all 16 members have equal chance, okay? So this is the most ideal method of uh, sampling simple random sampling so we just put all the 16 into a jar and we just take three out of it whereas systematic sampling will be done in a sequence okay so the sequence is known as sampling interval so it jump from one person to that sequence following that sequence so in order to find out the sequence that is a sampling interval we have to apply the formula that is total population by sample size so we are going to select uh, five people from 15 people okay so 15 by 5 is 3 okay so we need to select uh, in a sequence of 3 so what we do is we randomly uh, pick one uh, person okay so we uh, select the second person to as a starting point then we jump to the fifth person that is we are maintaining a three sampling interval then we jump to the eighth then we jump to the 11th then we jump to the 14th so if we finally get the required sample size that is 5 so first in the beginning we need to uh, find out the sequence okay that is sampling interval total population by sample size this is just a diagrammatic representation so sampling interval we need to find out that is total population we have 15 people and sample size required is 5 so 15 by 5 we get 3 
so three we can start from any person we can start from one person second person or third person okay so we cannot start from fourth person because if we start from fourth person what happens is uh, we will not reach the fifth person because four then seven ten thirteen then we don't have the sixteenth person so we need to start from one second or third because uh, three is our sampling interval so first second or third we can start from any person so usually it will be random sampling so we'll do random sampling for uh, these three so from from which sa sample to be started so sometimes if it starts from one then we follow the one four seven ten and thirteen if we starting from here two five eight 11 and 14. If we are starting from third person, 3, 6, 9, 12 and 15. So sampling interval is used for systematic sampling, whereas stratified sampling, sometimes the population will be heterogeneous. There will be males, females, uh, sometimes it will be uh, kids, teenagers, adult population. So what we know, do is, first we make them into strata. This is suppose adult people, this is teenage people, this is kids and from each population we randomly select people. Okay, so this is random sampling. So in probability sampling, the random sampling, this simple random is a basic level or basic sampling is done in all sampling method. So it ensures the equality, it ensures each participant's probability to be in the study. That is stratified sampling. Now we have cluster sampling. When we have big town or big district, what we do is first we make geographical clusters. Okay, geographical clusters we make, and from these clusters we randomly pick few clusters. That is, we have selected uh, maybe uh, cluster one from this, cluster five from this, and cluster six from this. So random sampling must be done at one point of time. So first we need to uh, make it as a cluster. And this is multi-stage sampling. So this is usually in a big population like a country or a state. What we do is first we select 25 district of uh, a state. Then we select 10 district out of 25 from random sampling. Then from this 10 district, we divide into boy secondary school and girl secondary school. Okay, so here we do stratified sampling. And from this, we do random sampling. And here also we do random sampling. So random sampling and also stratified sampling. And finally, we reach phono to secondary school heads. So it is... Uh, Reducing the number of samples to the desired level, but maintaining the probability sampling at all points. Sometimes we will be uh, following simple random sampling uh, from 10 district. We selecting this uh, girls and boys from that we have uh, done stratified random sampling and third stage again we have done simple random sampling. So it is multi-stage sampling. Okay, so here uh, 10 districts were selected by simple random sampling. Here this selected by stratified and here also is selected by simple random. Now non-probability sampling here the participants is not having any chance of being the study uh, because uh, non-probability convenient sampling. So my convenience is only this part of people. So I just select this group. So these many group of people lost the chance of being in the study because we are not doing any probability sampling. Here it is just convenience. Uh, so convenience is mostly uh, done for the uh, convenience of the researcher. So if he is starting a study which includes many panjayats or many villages, so he will just go to the nearby village because that is convenient for him. So the other village people lost the chance to be in the study. So it is not a good uh, sampling method, but 
this is most uh, commonly followed quota sampling is uh, uh, we can compare it with our uh, stratified sampling here what we do is uh, we select quota and we select uh, participants just like that uh, in a classroom where we have 50 students are male and 50 students are females uh, in stratified sampling if suppose we want to take five from each group we do simple random in 50 and we take five but in quota sampling we just take uh, five percentage any five people will be taking without any random sampling so it is only difference there is no random sampling here judgmental or purposive sampling uh, both are same so it is uh, like uh, a fashion manufacturer use a sample of uh, big customers because he is very uh, judgmental about the population he knows that uh, for him it is good to conduct a survey in a big customers so he'll do the customers uh, only he'll do the sample from only big customers so only include those who have traveled overseas for the past two years so uh, being judgmental about the sample or being uh, taking sample just for the purpose so that is purposive sampling and the snowball sampling it is uh, a very tricky sampling snowball sampling the name uh, it called because when we roll a snowball from the top of the mountain as it uh, goes downward it will uh, fetch the uh, ice particles over the track and it will start increasing its size that is why it's known as snowball sampling when it goes forward it collects all the ice particles where it gets contact with then it start increasing its size so when a small ice ball we started rolling from the top of the mountain once it's reached at the bottom it will be a bigger one Similarly, uh, studies which involves uh, privacy like homosexuals uh, or uh, the diseases which persons very reluctant to uh, reveal. So in the, those cases where we want to study uh, in those conditions, what we do is we select one person and ask that person to uh, search for uh, two other subjects and from each person we ask the same he must get one or two other uh, patients or other similar sample so that uh, their identity or their uh, anonymity their anonymity can be maintained and there is no uh, problems for the participants uh, their identity will be kept confidential so that is snowball sampling it's a uh, little uh, difficult to conduct now we have an exam uh, question that is training and calibration so training and calibration is nothing but standardizing and calibrating the examiners who are ready for the uh, examination so we must make sure that our examiners are very reliable uh, there should not be changes between the examiners that is one person might be knowing the criteria as well but the other person will not be knowing the criteria so that will create lots of problem so we must ensure the both the examiners are well uh, known about the criteria so for that we need to train and we need to calibrate the examiners so that is usually done using kappa statistics so once they are standardized about the procedure, diagnosis or the methods, we give them a uh, pilot study. So that same person will be uh, taking five patients uh, at different point of time and he needs to report the same uh, uh, values like DMFT we are taking uh, five people, five subjects will be measured by the same person and he must report the same DMFT values at both different point of time. So usually if he takes uh, 10 patient, uh, he must report the same value for at least 8 patient. Just an example hypothetically. So 
that how uh, we calculate the capacity statistics that is a um, reliability or the agreement uh, intra examiner reliability is the same person must report the uh, same result or the consistency should be there so that will be assessed using this capacity statistics usually it should be uh, around 0.8 then only we can allow the person to person for the uh, main study uh, whereas inter examiner reliability is a little different uh, when we have more than one person both the examiners should uh, do the uh, measurement on same patients and both the examiners should report same result there also we uh, do this capacity statistics and it should be more than 0.8 so for that question training and calibration you need to highlight the capacity at 6 and examiner training and calibration now we have uh, another uh, question that is uh, types of examination so this is uh, types of oral examination we have four types type 1 to 4 type 1 is complete examination it can be done at a college it can be done at a clinic where we have everything that is mouth mirror radiography, pulp vitality test, study models, laboratory test, everything is readily available. Whereas type 2 is limited examination. We have mouth mirror explorer with light with a radiograph. Uh, it can be uh, used in a surveys. Whereas type 3 inspection, it is only mouth mirror and explorer with light is there. It can be done in public health surveys. Uh, whereas is type 2 uh, for the combination of public health program to individual patients with population survey uh, whereas type 4 is just tongue depressor and uh, illumination so this is uh, uh, this method identifies individuals in urgent need of treatment okay it is uh, the unreliable for most public health survey now we have planning and evaluation chapter most commonly asked uh, define if by evaluation and the steps in evaluation so evaluation is nothing but process of determining the value of something or to the extent which goals are being achieved two types we have formative and uh, summative evaluation uh, so the first classification of evaluation is summative and formative summative is at the end of uh, the learning period formative is during the process of learning period can give you an example our first second and third internal exams are formative evaluation and your university examination is summative evaluation so we can follow the remaining uh, with the example of these that is a purpose of assessment of university examination or summative is to measure the competency whether you are uh, ready for checking patient or not to determine how well the students can do uh, relative to a given concept or skill Whereas a formative evaluation, that is the internals, is to improve the instructions or improve your performance. Uh, use of result, uh, university examination or summative evaluation to give grades. Whereas uh, formative evaluation, it can be a lesson for teachers to plan and modify the instructions. For student, uh, if is not performing well in first internal or second internal, he must do well in third internal to get the good marks so the formative evaluation is for improvement but summative evaluation is for grades so the example summative is end course result or public exam or university exam whereas the formative is your internal so it's very easy if you remember in this type and there are any many other types of uh, evaluation uh, that is uh, uh, types of evaluation uh, we have uh, criteria evaluation, uh, impact evaluation, uh, relevance evaluation, process effectiveness evaluation, efficiency evaluation are there. But these two summative and formative are mainly important and uh, some steps are there for evaluation uh, that is asked. So I forgot to mention here. So I'll add here. Uh, that is uh, general steps. Uh, first we need to determine what is to be evaluated then establish standards and criteria, then plan the methodology to be applied, gather information, analyze the result, take action and re-evaluate. So these are the steps of evaluation. Okay. Now we have the planning cycle. It was asked once. 
so planning uh, we have steps of planning that first we need to identify the problem what is the uh, high dental caries prevalence in a city first we need to do a needs assessment then collect the data using survey then we need to analyze the data and we need to determine the priorities where we have to apply the program mostly school children or women's uh, and we need to develop goal objectives goal is a a broad statement objectives are the measures to achieve the goal then we need to find out the resources the workforce time money so all type of resources we need to find out then we need to check for the constraints what are the problems the money problem the workforce problem time problem so we need to have a backup plan then from out of this we need to select a plan which is very effective then we need to implement then monitor finally evaluate so there are a few types of uh, health planning uh, first one this is asked once uh, types of planning so uh, we have uh, problem solving planning uh, then program planning problem solving is like uh, fluorosis in a community uh, then program planning that is school based fluoride rinse program then uh, coordination of efforts and activities planning that is closing of uh, obstetrics pediatric wards in an area where the birth rate is very declining and planning for allocation of resources that is fluoride mouth rinse program is getting replaced by sealant program so we need to uh, do planning so this was asked to once types of planning okay so planning cycle we need to uh, elaborate in your own uh, points but you need to maintain this flowchart so evaluation steps of evaluation is there uh, and other types are also there now we are into the last chapter that is entices in dental reprogrammers it's not uh, very commonly asked but uh, it is asked uh, uh, sometimes so this question is asked that is ideal characteristics and uh, describing or defining index is a numerical value uh, describing the relative status of a population on a graduated scale with definite upper and lower limit which is designed to permit and facilitate comparison with other population classified by the same criteria and method when you write definition you must write from the first word to last word you cannot uh, replace a preposition also so ideal requisites it should be simple clear it should be objective that is uh, investigator uh, should decide what it is there uh, the subjective interpretation can't be accepted it should be valid it should be sensitive it should be specific it should be reliable it should be acceptable and quantifiable you need to little bit uh, explain about all this Russell index is commonly asked we know Russell index for a periodontal index given by Russell it has got uh, six codes 0 1 2 4 6 and 8 0 is negative 1 is mild gingivitis 2 gingivitis 4 is used only for radiograph 6 is pocket formation and 8 is close of masticatory function uh, next periodontal index is CPITN which was given by WHO and FDA in 1982 the mouth is divided into six parts and using a WHO probe so this uh, CPITN was introduced by this Chuka Enamo for joint working committee on WHO and FDA in 1982 okay so this teeth examined are six quadrant and index teeth 110 3141 uh, 46 and 36 sorry I missed 36 and uh, 37 so 6 quadrant are there so these are the chords now this is CPI chords and this is treatment chords 0 1 2 3 4 X and 9 are the CPI chords 1 is bleeding 2 is calculus 3 4 are the pockets where 3 is a uh, black band of the probe is visible and 6 is not visible uh, treatment needs we have 0 now treatment 1 uh, self care 2 is for professional scaling 3 root planing and 4 complex therapy whereas CPI and loss of attachment because treatment need index CPI TN index was overestimated 
So what uh, in 1994 WHO replaced this treatment need part. So this part is replaced using a loss of attachment because so in Russell uh, index also what happened was this is very overestimated because actual sign of periodontal disease is loss of attachment that is nowhere mentioning in Russell index. So CPITN also nowhere mentioning the loss of attachment. So uh, CPI is CPITN where the treatment need is replaced by loss of attachment index by WHO in 1994. Okay. So here the CPI codes are same but the loss of attachment codes been added. Here 1 to 3 are loss of attachment 4 to 5 mm that is CJ it is measured from CJ to the bottom of sulcus. Whereas the CPA codes is measured from gingival margin to the bottom of sulcus. Okay. This is gingival margin to bottom of sulcus. This is CJ to bottom of sulcus. So two criteria should be there. Either uh, it can be uh, measured. This loss of attachment can be measured if the CPA code is 4. Otherwise there should be loss of attachment. Only in those two criteria we need to check CPA codes. If the CJ is not visible and the CPA score is 4 or otherwise if the CEJ is visible that means recession is present so 0 1 2 3 4 x and 9 similarly but it, the one also it's not like that one is like 4 to 5 mm loss of attachment so it's very difficult to see a loss of attachment 3 4 because 3 means it will be already grade 3 mobile so we get loss of attachment uh, mainly for 50 plus patients I mean age group. Uh, this uh, oral hygiene index is very simple given by John C. Green and Jacka Vermillion. It has got two components, debris index and calculus index. Uh, we have code 0123 that is less than one third, uh, less than two third and more than two third. And for debris index, stains are so present. So stains means definitely it is one irrespective of the surface area. Calculus also same 0, 1, 2, 3, but only thing is in 2 and 3 subgingival calculus is coming. So 2 means uh, individual flex, 3 means uh, the heavy band of subgingival calculus and we add the score, debris index and calculus index. So this is how we calculate 6 teeth, index teeth, uh, white is index teeth because it is the first tooth to be erupted in that quadrant. 161126363631 and 46 and we uh, use uh, lingual surface of 3, 6 and 4, 6 and we calculate it and we get interpretation good, fair, poor for debris index and calculus index individually we have 0 to 0.6 good, 0 0.7 to 1.8 fair, 1.9 to 3 poor for the OHI score that is the addition of these two 0 to 1.2, 1.3 to 3 and 3.1 to 6 okay uh, and the instruments we use is mouth number 23 explorer that is oral hygiene index uh, now we have dmft index it was introduced by henry clean caroli palmer and Hudson jw in 1938 uh, where we calculate uh, the pre, uh, decayed missing and filling tooth so dmft is 28 whereas dmf s is 128 if third molars are included it will be 148 so we have 28 teeth or 32 teeth so it is uh, DK uh, will be I mean, uh, written as D and missing will be uh, written only if it is missing due to caries and if it is only filled due to caries will be considered otherwise it will be empty. Okay and finally we add up all this DMF. Uh, in DMFS what happens is the canine to canine teeth will be divided into four surface muscle, lingual, mesial and distal and the um, premolar to molar will be divided into five surfaces there is an addition of one occlusal surface and we have two modifications 1987 and 1997 modification because uh, the main problem is we are considering filling and missing only due to case and we know that the missing and filling could be due to many other reason missing due to ortho reason missing due to trauma missing due to periodontal disease it's not considered in uh, 1938 criteria and filling also not considered preventive filling is not considered caries abrasion uh, sorry abrasion filling trauma filling nothing is considered so uh, later on it is modified by WHO in 1987 uh, third molars are also not considered in 1938 
so 87 modification three modifications are there third molars are considered temporary restrictions are considered as d and initial caries are excluded so in 38 criteria it is very easy to make it as a caries just a catch means we uh, make it as caries uh, 1997 criteria where we use a cpi pro so that was about dmft index and one more index uh, there might be a question of dean's fluorosis index that we already seen in uh, our fluoride chapter so that was all about this session uh, this was about entire survey procedure uh, planning and evaluation and uh, the first two chapter that is art uh, pit and fissure sealants and prr so next uh, session is uh, the sixth session we have one more session uh, seven sessions will be there so sixth session is about uh, healthcare delivery system dental auxiliary uh, finance in dental care and research methodology and there will be one more session so we have uh, now made it into seven parts because we were some uh, another questions being added up so let's make it a seven series seven part series so i'll come with uh, this part six in my next session so hope you must have uh, watched all the five parts if not uh, start from the first session so it is as i said it is a quick review not a replacement uh, for your preparation uh, i don't suggest it is a replacement you can use it as a adjunct for your preparation it will be like a quick review once you have prepared well you can uh, go through all this you will get a better uh, overall view of all questions and answers so always use it as a quick review i will come with this part six in my next session thank you Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in dentistry and more. Let's continue our question paper discussion of public health dentistry. We are into part 6 of the series. So we have one more part uh, that will be the last session of public health dentistry questions. Uh, we thought of uh, 6 uh, parts but uh, we have some few more uh, questions to be covered. So we added one more session. So in this part 6, uh, we have three chapters that is healthcare delivery systems, dental auxiliary and finance and dental care. Among these three, dental auxiliary is very important. Uh, mostly essay question will be asked from dental auxiliary. And finance and dental care, it's very confusing, a very tough chapter. Uh, so many short notes and short essay could be asked. And healthcare healthcare delivery systems it's not very frequently asked uh, chapter for university paper but you can expect a uh, few questions from that also so we'll start with healthcare delivery system that is how the health is being provided to our people uh, we have two sector public uh, sector and private sector uh, public sector we have uh, we know this is a three tier system primary secondary and tertiary Primary is the first level of contact through primary health centers and sub-centers using village health workers, ASHA workers, whereas the secondary level, uh, in primary uh, level, uh, basic procedures will be done. 
I mean vaccination, immunization, uh, sanitization, uh, health promotion, uh, health education, uh, and uh, one or two doctors will be there at primary health centers, sub centers. There will be just one doctor, and supporting staffs also very less. Uh, there won't be any inpatient facility in primary health centers mostly uh, but sometimes it will be there uh, whereas the community health centers or uh, district hospital that is secondary level where uh, most of the treatment can be done surgeries deliveries uh, because all specialist doctors will be there uh, lab technicians will be there uh, i mean lab facility will be there uh, x-ray facility will be there this is almost like a hospital and the tertiary level that is specialist hospital medical colleges where all the treatment will be done this is how uh, the three tier system is arranged uh, then we have health insurance schemes in our country uh, the insurance schemes are not very prevalent but still a very uh, minor percentage of people uh, can avail it uh, mainly the central government employees and the IT sector people under central government employee they have employees state insurance that is ESA plan then CGHS that is central government health scheme then universal health insurance scheme and even defense services railway hospitals are also providing healthcare in private sector that is the majority are depending on private sector through private private hospitals, polyclinics, uh, general practitioners and clinics and we have also a traditional indigenous system that is Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, Homeopathy. Then we have many voluntary health agencies, NGOs in our country, Red Cross Society, Kushtanivaran Sabha, uh, so many other, I don't remember many names. Uh, national health programs such as tuberculosis control program, tobacco control program, AIDS control program, many are there. It's still going on. Uh, one of the question, a uh, short note could be NRHM. That is National Rural Health Mission. It is to provide accessible, affordable, accountable uh, care to the poor and vulnerable people. Uh, it is started in 2005 and for a seven year period. Uh, mission uh, shall cover entire country with focus attention on 18 states uh, which has weak demographic so it is mainly using uh, asha workers that is accredited social health activities actually this asha worker is an upgraded version of village health guide so they act as a link between the people and primary health center so they basically address the issue of sanitation, hygiene, nutrition, safe drinking water and uh, basic determinants of good health. They just communicate with people because the Asha worker is from the same community and um, they uh, can um, definitely uh, make a significant change in people's uh, health. Uh, so under the NRHM plan, there are many key components that is to create ASHA workers that is 2.5 ASHA workers for a cater of 2.5 lakh villages in 4 years, creation of village health scheme, then strengthening of sub-centers and supply of drugs and supplementing vitamin A and folic acid deficiency for the children and promotion of private sector for achieving public health goals. So that was uh, NRHM. Now we have NUHM that is National Urban, urban Health Mission that is focusing on urban slum areas. The second question uh, could be ASHA that is Accredited Social Health Activist. So every village will be having a female ASHA. They will be chosen by an accountable to the panchayat and they act as an interface between community and the health system. So this ASHA would act as a bridge between ANM and village and they are accountable to the panchayat. And she will be an honorary volunteer receiving performance based compensation. They promote immunization, referral, escort service, 
uh, and construction of the toilets and healthcare delivery programs so they will be having a drug kit and they will be of a minimum uh, eight year standard of education and uh, they have uh, equipped with uh, this drug kit and they will be trained for doing the basic health services uh, that was regarding the asha now we have primary dental care so sometimes question will be coming as a primary dental care that is not present literally not present in our country because in india uh, primary health centers is not having a uh, dentist only two percentage of phc has a dentist at service uh, so the reason for lack of primary dental care is there is no oral health policies existing in our country and there is uh, no separate oral health budget allocation okay it is a health budget there is no oral health budget and lack of commitment and awareness of general public politicians and planning commission towards oral health and non existence of health insurance schemes regarding the oral health and lack of research so all these attributes to the uh, lack of dental care at a primary care uh, at primary level and lack of orientation and non availability of baseline data of prevalence and impact of oral disease also could be a problem now we are into the most important chapter of this session that is dental man power or dental auxiliary so the question will be define and classify that is the first part then uh, any uh, auxiliary could be asked as the remaining part it could be a hygienist or a therapist or a school dental nurse or surgery assistant so you need to know the functions of every uh, auxiliary let it be a non operating or a operating so before that you need to by heart the definition so auxiliary is a person who is given responsibility by a dentist so that this person can help the dentist in rendering the dental care but who is himself or herself not qualified with a dental degree and we have two classification non operating and operating non operating is auxiliaries which are not working on a patient that is surgery assistant secretary or receptionist lab technician or health educator whereas operating auxiliary they have the permission to work on a patient but under supervision of a dentist they can be a school dental nurse dental therapist dental hygienist and expanded function dental auxiliary so we'll start with non operating dental auxiliary the first one is dental surgery assistant so it was started by dr edmund sickles in 1885 is from new orleans usa so he hired a woman for the first time by that is by a dentist and he called the woman as lady in attendance just to help the patient uh, in draping the patient to giving the patient a napkin Uh, so it is mainly to attract female patient so it act as a four handed dentistry and it reduces the stress and workload of a dentist so this doctor has started appointing a dental auxiliary for the first time that is dental surgery assistant that is dr edmund c kells so the duties are preparation of patient preparation uh for giving uh, like mouthwashes napkins sterilization of instruments uh, restoring the materials presentation of documents uh, and after care of person so you must be knowing all the duties of a surgery assistant whereas a receptionist you know how the receptionists act and what is a job i don't need to tell you the secretarial work and patient reception duties uh, and dental technician Uh, dental technician is main for fu- function is fabrication of appliances uh, as per the directions and prescription given by the dentist and denturist is permitted to fabricate denture uh, directly for patients without dentist prescription so denturist uh, 
is a term applied to those dental lab technicians who are permitted to fabricate dentures directly for patients without a dentist prescription. They may be licensed or registered. So the, the process of denture making is known as denturism and the people who are doing this known as denturist. Okay. The ADA, American Dental Association, defines denturism as the fitting and dispensing of dentures illegally to the public. Okay, there is a lot of controversy uh, regarding this because they are not supposed to uh, create any dentures without a prescription. So, uh, Denmark uses the term denturist to describe a special category of dental technician who sits at an examination to enable him to prescribe, make and fit removable dentures without supervision. So, denturists in the state of Maine, denturists are permitted to take impression and fit dentures but only under the direction of a dentist. And in Tasmania, a state of Australia, was the first place where technicians were legally permitted to provide a prosthetic service. Okay, so in Tasmania, it is legally permitted. In Denmark, they used denturist term, uh, but uh, they can also do the dentures without supervision and in the state of Maine uh, denturist can take impression and fit dentures but only under direction but uh, ADA is vigorously opposing this uh, denturist because of this uh, quality uh, assurance is not there okay uh, that is regarding the denturist now we have dental health educator in a few countries uh, dental surgery assistant also being given a duty to teach the patient or educate the patient. Now we have operating dental auxiliary that is the first one New Zealand school dental nurse. Uh, so it was started in Wellington, New Zealand by T.A. Hunter in 1921 at the Dominion Training School for Dental Nurse. The training period was two years. So is known as the father of school dental nurse T.A. Hunter. Okay, the similar auxiliaries in present in Britain, they are known as New Cross Auxiliaries. Uh, they started in 1962 because one of the training school was located in New Cross uh, in South London. That is why that name uh, New Cross Auxiliaries. And dental nurses were present in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia and Hong Kong and even Australia. In Australia, they are known as therapists. Even they are present in Africa and America. In Canada also, uh, in Saskatchewan, dental nurses are present where someone other than dentist uh, is legally allowed to drill the tooth. They can uh, drill the tooth, Saskatchewan dental nurse in Canada. So their duties uh, are treating uh, school children. Basically one person is allotted 500 children and uh, they have to monitor the children or they have to do the treatment at a six months interval. They can do prophylaxis, placing filling in both permanent and dentition, uh, extracting teeth under local anesthesia. So like that. The second operating auxiliary is dental therapist. They are permitted to work but on a written treatment plan by the dentist. They cannot do independently. Uh, they can perform all functions as a school dental nurse but are not allowed to perform enterotic procedures and interpretation of x-rays. So they are known as uh, dental dressers in UK, okay, uh, and uh, they came into being due to the shortage of dental nurses. So in 1962, we already seen New Cross Auxiliaries present in UK. They changed the name to Therapist, okay. Before it was known as New Cross Auxiliaries. Now they are known as Therapist. In 1979, its name changed to. So, you know, the therapists are present uh, already in Australia, but in uh, Britain, it was known as New Cross Auxiliaries. But in 1979, they were named as therapists. So, they are permitted to work based on a written treatment plan by the dentist uh, or a prophylaxis extracting under local anesthesia, topical application, interpretation of x ray and antiviral procedures were not allowed. So, dental hygiene is the only one operating auxiliary present in our country or uh, they are approved by Dental Council of India. So Dr. Alfred Sivilian Fons is known as father of dental hygienist who appointed 
Mrs. Irene Newman uh, as his hygienist, the first dental hygienist. So the first training school for dental hygienists started in uh, November 1913. That was a course of seven months. So these are the duties: scaling, polishing, uh, radiograph, bleaching, occlusal spleen, sealings, photography, and uh, the preventive agents application. Now we have expanded function dental auxiliary. That is a dental assistant. That is a non-operating dental hygienist. That is an operating auxiliary. They receive further training. Okay, they already have some duties, but they receive expanded duties. So the technotherapist, they are the last scale service application of the expanded duty made in Philadelphia. So in Philadelphia, uh, the expanded function people are known as technotherapist. In Canada, uh, they have the assistant or hygienist. They get four levels of training. That is uh, certified dental assistant, preventive dental assistant. You can be a dental hygienist and dental hygienist with expanded duties. So their duties, we know, uh, they are either assistant or hygienist. But now, after expanded function, they do topical application of fluorides, desensitizing agent, pit and fissure, carving, removing matrix band, removing rubber dam, uh, nitrous oxide usage, removing sutures, removing and replacing ligature wire. Now we have frontier auxiliaries. So what is frontier auxiliaries? In rural areas where dental workforce is very minimal because most of the workforce is present in the urban area. So nurses and former dental assistants can be useful at this area uh, when they are provided with a minimal training. So they can be deployed to the rural areas. So they can do uh, prophylaxis, relief of pain, referral, fluoride rinse. Uh, denture repair, health education, all can be done using nurses and former dental assistant. But uh, we should give them training. And we have some new auxiliary types. WHO recommended new two types of auxiliary in 1959. That is dental licentiate and dental aid. Okay. So dental licentiate is a semi-independent operator trained for two years. So they can do oral prophylaxis, cavity preparation, extraction under relay draining of dental abscess and uh, treatment of uh, supporting tissues of the teeth. Whereas dental aid, they perform duties which include the first aid procedures for such as relief of pain, extraction and relay, control of hemorrhage. Their former training is four to six months. Okay. Uh, that is uh, dental licentiate for two years training, whereas dental aid is four to six months training. And the last uh, part of this dental auxiliary is the degree of supervision. So degree of supervision, uh, there are four types uh, based on the American Dental Association. That is general, indirect, direct and personal. How the dentist is supervising the auxiliary. Mm -hmm. So in general supervision, what happens is dentist is not present in the dental office. He authorizes the procedures and then destroys as per the authorization and as per the directions uh, it was uh, given. Whereas indirect supervision, authorization of dentist is the same, but the dentist is present in the dental office. Whereas direct supervision, dentist personally diagnose, personally authorize, personally evaluate before leaving the patient. So there is a direct supervision. Whereas personal supervision, actually the dentist is working. In these three cases, that is general, indirect, direct, the auxiliary is working on the patient is being supervised but personal supervision the dentist is working okay so general dentist is not there here dentist is there but he is busy with some other work but here the dentist is not busy or he is very uh, actively monitoring the case that is direct supervision so that was about uh, auxiliary now we are into the uh, last chapter of this section that is finance and dental care so the finance in dental care in Swaban Peter is the most the toughest chapter. It is very, very difficult because the problem is uh, in India or Indian scenario, finance is dental care. It's very, very simple. We have just one method that is pay for service. There is no insurance present in dental sector. Just pay for, for service. That is the patient goes to clinic, treatment is done and he take the money or take the card or do the uh, UPA uh, transfer. 
done. The procedure is done. There is no third party. There is no insurance. Nothing is there. But in this chapter, what is given is the complete scenario of United States of America. So what we are studying in this chapter is the scenario of America. So that is why it is becoming a very difficult chapter for the students. So uh, spending more time on finance, it's not worthy. Uh, unlike the epidemiology, I previously uh, said the uh, more time you spend on epidemiology would definitely benefit you because uh, it is uh, like a, a knowledge gaining when you go for uh, your masters definitely it would help but finance and dental care uh, better you don't spend much time on this but try to understand the concept and study this only for your exam because this is uh, nowhere benefiting you because it is not the Indian scenario we are talking about or we are going to study about. So anyway, I will start with finance and dental care. So this is the most common asked question that is a payment. Okay, so we have five methods. Private fee for service that is the Indian scenario. Post payment plan, we don't have post payment plan. Private third party prepayment plan, we don't have any of this plan. That includes commercial insurance companies, non-profit organization, it can be a Delta plan, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and it can be a prepaid group like HMO, and it can be a capitation plan. This all comes under private third party prepayment plan. Okay, prepayment, just like prepayment, we are paying before the start of procedure or before the before availing the procedure. But post payment plan, first we receive the treatment, we avail the treatment first, then we pay. Okay. Uh, then we have salary. Salary is also present in our country and public health programs are very, very less in uh, regard to the oral health. So private fee for service in our country, it is very administratively easy to a traditional form, but the low income people cannot afford this. And post payment plan, which is also known as budget plan, it is just like taking loan to pay. Okay, so we uh, first borrows money from or patient borrows money from bank or some other agency and pay the dentist fee okay so once application is approved uh, and the treatment is done already but we have made our paperwork uh, done before that and we have uh, got everything ready so the bank pays to the dentist okay once the treatment done bank pays to the dentist and we have a period of time where we can repay to the bank on an installed amount. So it is uh, mainly uh, indicated for low income people and it started in Pennsylvania in 1930s but it is actually utilized by middle income people and it was nowhere reaching its purpose. So the treatment will be done uh, at first and later we pay the money. So dentist is anyway paid once the treatment is done he is paid by the bank but before uh, starting the treatment or before going to the dentist we need to make our paper ready so you might not be uh, getting the point because this is not what we see in our country so this is all american scenario so anyway this is how it is post payment plan you know how the uh, sim card is like post payment post payment plan and prepayment plan post payment means you use it for one month and at the end you pay for it prepayment you pay uh, at the beginning of your month and then you use it okay it's just like that and the private third party prepayment plan uh, there will be a third party in post payment plan also there is a third party your third party is the bank so first party is the patient second party is the dentist and any person other than these two is a third party. So first you understand the concept that is a third party. Okay, it can be an insurance agent, can be a bank, it can be an agency, it can be an association. So it can be a firm, anything it can be who manages these two parties. Okay, so prepayment plan is just like that. Uh, we pay uh, before that service. Uh, the dentist uh, and this first and second party there will be administer between these two and uh, salary is just like uh, at the end of the month we get a fixed salary there will not be any incentives it won't be a very uh, 
encouraging uh, method of payment for the dentist and uh, public health programs this is all programs of uh, USA and UK so public health programs by Medicare Medicare is programs of uh, USA and national health insurance is of UK uh, one more question uh, that is short on health maintenance organization this is a prepaid group prepaid group means it works as a group of people or a group of dentists with many specialties or one specialty it is just like a dental hospital uh, you know hospital will be having all the type of treatment all specialties everything will be uh, done there okay so many doctors will be there similarly health maintenance organization uh, is in that fashion you need to think of a dental hospital so there are four components okay the components are four principles so there is a very difficult definition for this it provides services to the individuals they are enrolled in the organization so any person in USA or a European country has to enroll or has to take a insurance because there is no direct uh, first party second party arrangement in uh, those countries you have to go through a third party and you have to fix an appointment and make your papers ready before getting a treatment that is why it is becoming very difficult very costly uh, treatment over there so this is a uh, four principles that is there will be a system of healthcare and the treatment provided through this healthcare and a group of people uh, they are enrolled in this HMO and there will be a reimbursement mechanism this is how it is being worked okay there is a uh, dental hospital network and the treatment services provided through this network and the number of people who is uh, taken membership in, in this HMO and how the dentist who is working under this organization being paid by the third party so HMO act as a third party here they act as a uh, administrator between the dentist and the patients so it can work as a staff model group model and IP and primary care capitated it is a group model staff model HMO pays individually to the each person in the dental hospital it's all hypothetical scenario Whereas a group model, HMO pays a bulk amount to the dental hospital and the authority of dental hospital divides the money and give to the employees. Independent Practice Association, if you don't want to work in a hospital setup under HMO, you can work as an independent practice association still under HMO. Okay. And the last one is primary care capitated network that is uh, uh, a mechanism of capitation fee uh, where the dentists are paid based on the number of people uh, they are checking rather than the treatment they are doing now the question is insurable risk so when a risk can be insured under these five criteria a risk can be insured that is it should be precisely definable so a damage is happening to our vehicle should be definable damage then only the company will give us insurance and it should be of sufficient magnitude and it constitute a major loss and it should be very infrequent if something happens very frequently they won't give insurance because the insurance company will be uh, in a losing uh, side if they are giving claims for uh, every damage or if the damage is happening very frequently so their expectation is they take a policy from 100 people and only 10 cars will be damaged and it should be of unwanted nature okay this uh, accidents and this damage is always an unwanted nature they are not expecting it they don't want that and it should be beyond the control of individual that is why uh, the risk is uh, or these five reasons are the thing where uh, risk can be insured because this is not coming anywhere near to our health because health is under control of individual health is definitely a wanted nature and we 
get diseases very frequently and we cannot define it properly and the laws defining a loss is very difficult in regard to health so that is why health insurance is very crucial and very tricky one so what insurance company did to overcome this problem they have made some uh, changes in policies regard to health insurance that is uh, they don't give entire uh, money to the patients they keep a sharing business that is having patients pay share of cost and they don't give uh, insurance for every treatment they limited uh, range of services uh, cosmetic restrictions are not covered implants are not covered and they offer coverage only to groups okay they don't give for every people because a 40 plus uh, patient would be having definitely many dental problems so they don't give uh, much insurance to the aged people and they always keep waiting periods because uh, they want to uh, give insurance for a normal person who is having a unexpected problem so in order to ma- maintain that policy they keep waiting period and make sure that they don't have any pre existing disease and they keep pre authorization and annual expenditure limit and they before that uh, policy only they inform the patients that these are the annual expenditure limit and these are the procedures would be treated or the diseases would be treated now the capitation fee is another mechanism where an established sum on a monthly or yearly basis will be given to the dentist as a reimbursement mechanism based on the eligible patient so this money will be paid regardless whether the patient utilizes the care or not okay so the dentist will be getting the money so in hmo there is we have seen uh, this capitation uh, fee was there uh, in return the patient can receive a prescribed set of services over a specified period of time so this is basically on eligible num- number of eligible patients and regardless of the treatment if patient uh, uses the treatment or not using the treatment the dentist would get the reimbursement for that person now we have another question that is 90th percentile it comes under delta and the plan so this is a little bit of maths uh, you need to imagine a uh, 100 people are writing an exam where the highest mark is 100 okay and you got marks of all 100 people and you are putting the marks into a uh, ascending order and the highest mark it could be a 95 or 94 or 83 84 depending upon the toughness of the paper the highest mark will be the 100th percentile because under that mark or under that value all 100 people's mark will be present so that highest mark is 100 percentile similarly since you are putting it in, a, in ascending order the 90th person or the 90th highest mark will be the 90th person day so under that value there will be 90 people or 89 people if excluding that person similarly 50th person day is a value under which 50 percentage of the observation lies 40 percentile means it is a value under which 40 percentage of the observation lies so in order to get that exact percentage you need to put the marks or the remuneration or reimbursement in a ascending order and you have to calculate the value so if the exam is tough the percentage will be uh, coming down and if it is very easy it is going up so here you can see the 90th percentile is 14 dollar that is 90 percentage of the dentist are paying or asking charges 14 dollar or less then 80 percentile uh, 60 percentile is 13 dollar 50 percentile is uh, 12.5 dollar that is 50 percentage of the participants are asking 
the rate of 12.50 so 50th percentile is 12.5 90th percentile is 14 dollar hope you understood this you need to think of two scenario 100 people writing an example uh, exam of 100 marks and the highest person is 100 percentile and the lowest person is a 0 percentile or a first percentile and 90th percentile is a person who is scoring a 90th position that value is 90th percentile now we have post payment plan and finance that is uh, we already seen budget payment plan uh, Indian scenario that is the fee for service is very common dental insurance is very negligible we have some ESA plan CGHS defense and state government hospitals now we need to learn about the type of payment okay how the patient can pay the third party under three mechanism deductible which is also known as front end payment coinsurance and group insurance so this is how the patient pays to the third party okay so we are talking about a three party arrangement okay first part is a patient or dentist second part is a dentist or patient you can make it vice versa no issues but the third part is a third person so deductible or front end payment is like a fixed amount that patient pays to the uh, third party uh, like if uh, insurance of deductible thousand means ten thousand means if damage occurred the owner pays only ten thousand but he may reach up to one lakh of reimbursement there is coinsurance where the patient also pays a part of it so here it will be 40 60 percentage then he has to pay uh, 40 thousand and the remaining 60 only will be pay reimbursed by the uh, insurance company group insurance is uh, insurance which is applied or which is offered to group okay just like the school children whereas the reimbursement how the third party is giving the money back to dentist it can be a UCR mechanism, table of allowances and fee schedule. UCR mechanism is the most apt method, the best method of uh, finance. UCR is usual customary and reasonable fee. UCR uh, where the usual is a usual uh, charge for a given service by an individual dentist. It depends on his qualification and the area where he is working. So usual fee of dentist can be widely varied. A BDS doctor uh, charges 500 rupees for a scaling, whereas a MDS doctor charges 1000 rupees. A rural uh, side uh, scaling will be charged uh, 300, but in a urban setup it will be 500. So similarly, it will be different for each patient. Customary fee uh, when the fee is customary when it is in range of usual fee charged by the dentist of similar training and experience for same service in specific area it is nothing but uh, in a city where uh, the dentist uh, just like i said uh, bds people charge uh, 300 uh, i mean 500 for scaling and mds people charge 1000 for uh, scaling so it is a customer friendly fee okay so usually in use here mechanism the ultimate fee is not decided by the dentist it is decided by the third party so how they are deciding is they take the usual fee and customary fee of all dentists who are practicing there and then they decide so even if a person or a dentist keep his usual fee is very high there is no point because the third party or the delta dental plan they planning to use a percentile mechanism where the individual dentist uh, fee is uh, nowhere coming for the uh, calculation so when a person's uh, dentist fee so customary fee is in an area where uh, the charges are in a range of uh, usual fee that becomes customary so both are mating means it is reasonable so suppose a person uh, usually in an area in a town the scaling charge is 500 
for BDS people. A person, a BDS doctor named A is charging 700 and a person uh, named B charging 300 and a person named C charging 500. So usually it is 500. So only the charge uh, by the dentist C, A, B, C can be said as customary fee because others are not in the range of the usual fee decided by the third party okay it is uh, it's very confusing uh, whereas table of allowances is defined as a list of covered services for each service so uh, the dentist will be having a list of allowances what they get okay for each treatment from the third party so the problem is if sometimes the dentist fee becomes more than what they are uh, supposed to get so what they do is the remaining amount because uh, when he starts a filling usually the filling allowance is 100 rupees but he might have to add more amount of filling material so the charge will be 150 but he would get only 100 rupees from the third party so what he do is the remaining 50 he takes from the patient so this method is not satisfactory because the patients are often unaware that the plan may not cover them in full of dental care because the patient might think that they will not be charged anything but some dentist might ask extra amount that is a problem of table of allowances because the fixed allowances only will be given to these dentists by the third party so similarly there is one more term that is fee schedules so there will be uh, the third party is using the main payment of many dentists in a certain area to decide the fee schedule. Now we have the main question that is the Delta Dental Plan. This is a non-profit organization uh, which is synonymous with Dental Service Corporation. Uh, they usually uh, subjected to insurance law of the state that is the state where they are uh, pl planning to operate in uh, USA uh, its first name was National Association of Dental Service Plan NADSP in 1966 uh, later they changed to Delta Dental Plan in 1969 it has got two uh, types of dentist uh, practicing under participating and non-participating participating dentist has to pre-file their usual and customary fee before I was explaining uh, in detail I don't know how much uh, concept you would get so this is how it is first we need to file our usual fee my usual fee for a scaling would be 700 rupees but the customary fee in that area would be 500 rupees okay so it depends the qualification I have or the area where I work and it changes from dentist to dentist so usual fee will be changing customary fee will be common for an area and for a particular qualification but in for non participating that refiling is not required okay so participating dentist uh, patients will be of only Delta dental plan non participating dentist can take any dentist any patients even from uh, outside the Delta Dental Plan but the participating dentist get uh, reimbursement in a 90th percentile but he gets just 50 percentile but he gets patients from outside also uh, there will be fee auditors there will be inspection but here there is no fee auditing there is no inspection and there will be some amount of fund goes to the reserve fund Delta Reserve Fund here they don't need to give any Delta Reserve Fund this is what we were seeing regarding the public health program that is Medicare and Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Medicaid, Medicare is 18th Amendment Act 1965 for people aged 65 and over. It has got two parts, part A, part B, hospital and supplemental medical insurance. So the dental segment is limited because uh, they need hospitalization. Whereas Medicaid is a 19th uh, Amendment. Of Social Security Act 
uh, inpatient care is there, outpatient care is there, lab, x-ray service and early and periodic screening program for individuals under 21 is there. Blue Cross and Blue Shield is another public health program where the payment is at 50th percentile. It is actually the association of 38 separate health insurance organizations. So Blue Cross started in 1960 and Blue Shield in 1948 and they merged in 1982. It is just like another non-profit organization like Delta Plan. So we have two non-profit organization one is Delta Plan and the next one is Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So that was all about finance and dental care just like I said finance and dental care is very confusing. It is completely hypothetical uh, scenario where you would not understand uh, the hypothesis what I was talking about. So only thing is you need to understand the usual and customary fee that was little confusing. Usual fee is a fee charged by a dentist. It can be uh, anything because that is his choice, his autonomy. Whereas customary fee depends on the area where he works and it depends on the uh, qualification it is not decided by the person okay it is uh, amount which is uh, present in that area in a town where BDS people can charge this much MDS people can charge this much that is a customary fee and when these two becomes uh, almost same because I charge a 500 rupees for scaling uh, and the customary fee is present in that area for my qualification is also 500 so my fee become reasonable similarly this deductible coinsurance and group insurance deductible is front end payment there is no uh, percentage sharing coinsurance is percentage sharing similarly the ucr mechanism i told table of allowances and fee schedule table of allowances the problem is uh, sometimes there will be additional payment has to be uh, taken from the patient similarly fee schedule it takes the mean payment and in the scenario 90th percentile is a concept it is a number of percentage or number of observation lies under which 90 to 90 uh, value or 50th value or 40th value so that was about uh, health insurance i mean the finance in dental care so we have the last session uh, that is coming in two days hopefully uh, it includes research methodology biostatistics ethics it's a main chapter then many short notes practice management health agencies and many short notes so i not completed it uh, we have many short notes like palliative care contingency management social norms taboo monitoring and surveillance, public-private partnership, home, WHO and many uh, short notes are yet to be added. So, hope you understood this part 6. Okay, so we studied today finance and dental care, dental auxiliary and the national health care delivery systems. So I'll come up with the last part in my next session within two days. Thank you.